Okay, good morning and welcome everyone to the seventh meeting of the Local Government and Communities Committee in 2018. Can I remind everyone present to turn off mobile phones and as meeting papers are provided in digital format, tablets may be used by members during the meeting. Despite the weather, we've got a full house this morning, I'm delighted to say. No apologies have been received. And we move to agenda item one, the Planning Scotland Bill. And the committee will take evidence on the bill at stage one in two panels. Uh, but before we move to the first panel, uh, can we uh, start this evidence session? I want to put on record my and the committee's thanks to all those who attended our Planning Bill conference at Fourth Valley College in Stirling on Monday. I would invite members at this point to comment. Uh, in relation to, to how that went. We'd normally do that as a practice and put that on the public record because time is tight with us this morning. But there will be a summary of notes produced in relation to those discussions and that will be published. So thank you to everyone who attended that. Some really useful input which will help, help our scrutiny. So that said, we now move to our first witness panel and can I welcome, and I'll introduce everyone in the winner here, uh, Claire Simmons Chair and Dr Andy Inch, Trustee Planning Democracy and Dr Carla McLeod, Policy Director, Community Land Scotland, uh, Ian Cook, Director, Developments Trust Association Scotland and Petra Bieberbach, uh, Chief Executive, Planning Aid Scotland. Thank you everyone uh, for coming along and for making it through the what has been called the beast from the east this morning with the, with the bad weather and members of the public gathering with a lot of interest in this in the next evidence session so thank you everyone for making the effort to attend this morning. We're, we're going to allow for some brief opening statements, maybe around two minutes would, would be good uh, to, to allow that interaction between e each of the witnesses and members to ask questions as much time as possible for that. So we'll perhaps go from uh, my left to right here. So I don't know if uh, Dr Inch or Claire Simmons wishes to make o opening remarks on behalf of Planning Democracy. Thank Claire. you. Uh, well, thank you for inviting us. Uh, we're very appreciative of the uh, opportunity. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm the chair of Planning Democracy. Uh, we're a charity. Uh, we're volunteer-led, and we've been around since 2009, and we campaign for a fairer, more inclusive uh, planning system in Scotland. Um, we've got a community network, uh, around 500 uh, people in this network now, um, including community councils, individuals and uh, organisations. Um, and we have a regular interaction and sort of try and provide support for each other um, with, through that network. So that's a little bit about us. Uh, a little bit about me. I've also got a cold, so I also got a tickly cough. So I might have to suddenly throw something over to Andy if I have a coughing fit. Um, but uh, just as an opening, is this the opening statement or is this? Uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> I better get on with it then. I? Um, so uh, what planning democracy is really asking for is for a planning system that is seen uh, as a way of positively shaping uh, pla uh, the place that we live in. Uh, we see it as a mechanism that you can change the way market delivers better quality housing and removes speculation on land and so on. And we feel that the planning bill possibly has uh, viewed uh, planning as a negative thing, that uh, as a problem that gets in the way of development. Um, but we see it as a vital part of our democracy. Um, and of course, everybody knows that one of the things that we've been campaigning for is equal rights of appeal. And um, we think that uh, this is a, a mechanism that we can achieve a stronger plan-led system. And this is something that we really want to achieve. And I think that's, uh, that's across the board. A lot of people want to support a plan-led system. Um, and we're also keen to overcome some of the problems that have been uh, brought up about the lack of public trust in planning. And we do feel that perhaps ERA has been presented as a blunt instrument to, that slows things down and polarises and seen as a divisive tool. Um, and it was rather hastily dismissed as such, but we want to sort of see it as um, something that is possible, that you can design a new system with this tool uh, that reinforces the principle of a plan-led system and it encourages people to be engaged at an early stage. So um, I think that's all I'll say for now as my opening statement. Thank you. Very much almost bang on time, Ms. Simmons. Uh, no pressure, Dr. McLeod. Uh, your opening statement. Well, um, well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Committee, on behalf of uh, Committee Land Scotland for the invitation to uh, participate in this evidence session this morning on uh, what we see as a very important uh, piece of legislation in terms of taking forward uh, the planning framework, but also connecting to other areas of public policy in Scotland as well. Uh, it's very welcome in the policy memorandum that. Um, it, it 
talks very much about moving uh, the planning system from, from being a, a reactionary process to actually helping to, to promote and support investment and, and make good quality placemaking. Uh, we provided uh, a very succinct written submission in terms of our evidence to uh, the, the committee itself. Uh, we focused on local place planning. Uh, but we also focused on a, a kind of wider set of issues that we think are important in terms of helping to, to uh, take the planning process forward and, and connect to that wider agenda, specifically in relation to th thinking about uh, issues of repopulation and resettlement and how that might tie into elements of, of uh, the planning process and, and wider issues of rural and indeed urban uh, sustainable development and also thinking about uh, the powers in relation to that and ways in which we can actually rethink and reimagine in a practical policy oriented sense people's places within landscapes as well, within rural landscapes uh, and, and what their kind of role is in relation to that. And so the, the ambition of this bill in terms of having more community engagement, having more community consultation, having a kind of uh, more kind of progressive approach, if you will, in relation to, to, to the planning process is very welcome from our perspective. And as a representative organisation, we look forward to discussing the various aspects of our submission within the context of the, the broader discussion today. Thank you very much, Dr McLeod. Ian Cook. Chair, and good morning, everyone. Um, I think the first thing I would want to say is that um, I'm here from Development Trust Association Scotland, so we've got 255 members and communities scattered throughout Scotland, all involved primarily in what I would call placemaking. Um, so I think that the, our interest in the bill is very much around how this bill assists communities and others to, um, I suppose, create the kind of places that people want to live in. I would say from the outset that I am certainly not a planning expert. Um, the views which DTA Scotland put forward to the committee were very much views drawn from our membership. So that's communities across the country who have engaged or tried to engage in the planning process either to um, get consent for planning, uh, community led uh, development or to try and influence um, uh, planning applications which they felt would impact on their community. I mean, it's probably fair to say that from our experience of speaking to members, um, there's a fairly strong view that the views of communities do not currently get taken into account sufficiently and often tend to be uh, overridden by the views of developers or the, or the plans of developers. So there's certainly a kind of imbalance which we hope the bill will uh, address. Um, the, the only other thing I would sort of add, I suppose, is by way of opening remarks, is that we're quite keen to explore where some of the um, cross-cutting policy uh, agendas might be around community empowerment, how this connects with land reform, and I suppose given that planning is very much about local democracy, how it might connect with the forthcoming local democracy bill. Thank you very much, Mr Cook. And uh, Pe Peter Bieberbach. OK, thank you very much for inviting me. And my name is Peter Bieberbach, and I'm the chief executive of PASS. Um, I've also been on the member of the independent review, which put forward a recommendation for changes in the planning system. Um, I also am on the board of Loch Lomond and the Drossax National Park and chair the Planning and Access Committee over there, so I have first-hand experience of how the planning system works in practice. Um, I'm also on the uh, local housing association link group and I'm the vice chair. We, the committee will have already read our response to the bill, so I just want to take the opportunity to give you a little bit more details of, about how PASS operates. About 20% of planners in Scotland volunteer for the organisation. Um, increasingly also we see other build environment professional coming into this because again it moves into a more place agenda. We also have architects, urban designers, uh, environmentalists working with us. PASS has, is celebrating its 25th anniversary this year. It is, as I said, volunteer-led for over 400 volunteers. We have three key services. In the first 15 years of the organisation, it had an, and has an advice service, which I would say is very reacting because people phone us or email us in and wanting some advice. Last year, we dealt with about 800 cases. Uh, in addition to that, there's about 1,000 inquiries, which are not necessarily cases because you don't necessarily need to ascribe them to a volunteer. We also help community organisations in a very proactive way and expanded our programme over the last 10 years considerably working through charrette processes, but also on the ground with uh, community groups who want to maybe take on assets and uh, work wanting to become small-scale developers themselves. So we're quite closely with development trust associations. 
Increasingly, however, I think to address some of the anomaly in the planning system, we work with what we call seldom heard groups. They include gypsy travellers. We still have a system where we don't provide enough sites in appropriate location for gypsy travellers. We also, heard, also engage very proactively with uh, young people because we think that one of the failures of the planning system is that too few people actually know that it exists and therefore only get involved very late in the process. So by actually working with schools and community groups and with a youth clubs, we find that um, young people are very much ready to be involved in the place agenda. Last month, we launched the youth volunteer program. And again, we have 200 people turning up as volunteers. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. I uh, appreciate your opening remarks. And we'll move straight to questions. Um, Jenny Gilruth. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning. To the panel. The legislation proposes a local place plan um, as a new feature of the planning system and any LPP would have to have regard for the local development plan and the national planning framework. So does the panel believe that asking local councils to have regard for these LPPs is sufficiently robust? Local place plans, having regard for them. Um, Dr Lynch. Um, I, th I think it's, it's a weak mechanism. So local place plans sound rather like the neighbourhood plans which have been in existence in England since around 2010. Neighbourhood plans in England form a part of the statutory development plan, so uh, along with the local plan in England, uh, which means that uh, they're, they're given greater weight in decision making. One of the features, the odd features of the planning system in Scotland and in England also is that there's a bit of a gap between what's in a plan, which is indicative, and subsequent decisions. Uh, which don't need to follow that plan if other material considerations indicate otherwise, as I'm sure the committee might be aware. What, what that does is means that the aspiration for a plan-led system can be quite difficult to achieve. One of the risks of local place plans having a weak status in decision-making is that communities and others could invest hundreds of hours and a huge amount of voluntary time and effort into their production, only to find that subsequent decisions broadly disregard the provisions of a local place plan. That happens in England in some sort of fairly celebrated cases in England recently where that's happened despite the stronger status that neighbourhood plans have compared to what's proposed for local place plans. So I think there's some real concern there about how much time and effort you're asking people to invest in a process without any guarantees at the end of the, the process that there's going to be any accountability for the decisions that are subsequently made. So I think you can local place plans could be a very positive way of engaging people early on, but you also need to think about uh, what's happening at the end of that process and how those plans are actually being implemented. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else to take up? Ian Cook, first of all. Yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I think the first thing to, I suppose, note is that local place plans are not particularly new, that communities up and down the country have been doing variations of local place plans for some time. Um, in our experience, there's very little um, evidence of uh, planning authorities really recognising and giving any weight to local place plans. So I suppose, in regard to the question of having regard to, um, we would be concerned that... Um, there is a clear link between any local place plans and the statutory planning process. I think the local place plans, I mean, we, we are very supportive of the, the proposal for local place plans, but they will achieve very little unless they are accompanied by um, quite clear, a quite clear statement about the kind of purpose and the status of the plans. Um, so I suppose um, some of this might get done within statutory guidance, but we think that there is a way to kind of evolve place plans so that they have criteria and depending on how much or, or what the communities want to build into their kind of local place plans, then that there's a kind of legal consequence in terms of what the local authority, what the planning authority must do, do to, in terms of responding and acknowledging to that. Thank you. Um, can, can I just check? Jenny, it's just in case others want to come in Sorry. and answer the question as well. No, my apologies for, for cutting across you there, Jenny. Um, Dr McLeod, did you want to come in? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Kimiar. Um We would we'd certainly reiterate the, the, the points and, and, and emphasise the point that local place plans are, are a welcome development in terms of the, the kind of decision-making infrastructure of the planning process and how that connects to wider uh, issues as well. But uh, it is, as, as colleagues have already said, very important to ensure that there is a clear connection between uh, the local place plans themselves in terms of their purpose, how they're resourced and what they're designed to achieve and how that connects uh, to the development plan uh, and, and, and the kind of wider framework within that context. So uh, it, it's, it's clearly important that, that, that there's a link in to that and that, that, that's, that's clearly implementable and 
uh, achievable in practice in terms of making that linkage? Because clearly it, it is um, an opportunity for local communities to actually have a stake and a voice, which sometimes I think some, gets airbrushed out of the planning process uh, in relation to actually um, deciding what should be developed and, and, and move forward at, at the local level. So the, the plans are, are a useful mechanism potentially in that respect, but there does need to be a connection with uh, the local development plan, which is, is clear within that context and tying into that. Etra, do you want to add something? Yeah, I think as it currently stands, it's too weak. I think we want to see a much stronger duty because mm. if we really have a plan-led system, then it has to cascade up as well as down. The local place plan is a key I think it's a key driver to change the current planning system. It's a key driver in, in affording everyone in the community to actually come together to plan for their place. So therefore, I would say, I would agree with some of the statements around aligning it better with other policy formation like Community Empowerment Act and also the land reform. But also, we are now consulting currently on a socio-economic duty for local development plans. Again, it has to fit in. So the discussion around place, what we need from place, has to be had at that very local level with everyone involved. And so therefore, I would say it also then has to be given proper status and so that it doesn't become just a tokenistic approach. Furthermore, I would say it needs to be aligned with the local development plan, as we know, it moves to a 10-year cycle. Um, so probably a regular update of the local place plan, a regular conversation with all the different drivers and communities within that is very, very important. I would say that unlike England, the English system certainly has not worked. It has worked in certain areas, uh, but it has been given le very little credence. There is a different system in Scotland in front of us, so I think we can drive something very new here. Thank you. Jenny Gorris. Thank you, Convener. Um, I suppose going back to Callum McLeod's point, um, there is an issue associated in your submission, you say, with costs and the support required in terms of developing these plans. I suppose there's also an issue in terms of community capacity. And Ian Cook, in your submission, you point to local place plans working well when there is a sense of genuine ownership by local people. But not all communities are starting from the same base level and not all communities have that buy-in and that engagement. And I wonder, therefore, what the panel's views might be with regard to... Um, it, poorer areas, for example, not engaging with the process or feeling that they don't have the capacity to engage with the process because they might not have done so in the past, does the legislation disadvantage them in its current form? Is well, McLeod, uh, there may be two chapel actually mentioned, Dr McLeod. I think that raises an important point to raise in terms of the, the levels of capacity that different communities might have in relation to responding to the, the challenge and opportunity of local place plans themselves. So I think it's, it's very important that the... Uh, communities in that position have resources and are, are provided with resources to enable them to, to actually um, have a, a say and, 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 a, and, a, and a capacity to actually uh, help shape that kind of process itself in, in terms of shaping what's going to be in the, the place plan itself. So support from um, various sources should be, should be part of that process, I think, in terms of building capacity. Now, whether that's from... Um, Government itself, with some other other sources, in terms of different partnership arrangements, that's that, that's something that that um, needs to be uh, looked at very carefully in terms of what the optimal solutions are in relation to that. But clearly, it is unrealistic to expect communities that may have different levels of capacity to actually be able to engage unless they have support to do that. And that is not a reason for them not. It's quite the reverse, in fact, to ensure that communities do have that opportunity and that we do get. Um, from the bottom up, actually, a fit between what communities' aspirations are for placemaking itself and how that fits in the, the, the broader framework. Uh, and that, that really, I think, needs to be, uh, Community Land Scotland would think, needs to be kind of driven forward and kind of hardwired into this uh, process in this bill. Mention, Mr Cook, I don't know if you want to comment. Um, yeah. Um, I think um, I mean, the first thing I would sort of say is that, I mean, our experience is that there's lots of disadvantaged communities involved in trying to improve their particular communities. Um, it's not just restricted to sort of higher capacity communities, but I appreciate the point that um, in order to do that, they, they may require a, additional support, etc. So there's definitely an interest there. I mean, I think the key to this um, is communities having sort of community anchor organisations. So communities that don't have development trusts, for instance, and a lot of the disadvantaged communities have local, locally controlled or locally led housing associations who are very well placed, I think, to provide a kind of key role 
and, and, and the sort of production or the support of local place plans. Um, but I do accept that when we're, when we're looking at resourcing, and resourcing is really crucial, I mean, this, this will not work unless it's sufficiently resourced, then perhaps we need to reflect the particular needs of disadvantaged communities within how we make um, resources available, both in terms of financial resources and technical support. Uh, can, I, can I suggest suggest that on a practical level, um, if we are moving towards a great alignment between spatial planning and community planning, in many uh, areas you have community local planning outcome agreements, and I would suggest that perhaps some of the alignment could also be between budgets of community planning partnerships and a, the spatial planning departments, so that actually there's a working together on the ground. And capacity building is absolutely vital, but more importantly is for those very communities who don't feel that they have been given a voice in the past to be much more empowered to do so. Dr. Lynch? <coughs> yeah, thanks. I think we'd very much agree that the aspiration to join things up locally, at a very local level, at the, uh, with community planning and other processes is, is the right one. I think there's a real challenge there. I think the resource implications are huge and the capacity building and the kind of work that would be required to achieve that are massive. The financial memorandum suggests, I think there's a figure of, I'm maybe wrong, my memory's not great, £13,000 or something like that per local place plan, which I believe has probably been borrowed from some research produced by locality in England in relation to the neighbourhood planning process. As I understand it from speaking to colleagues who studied the neighbourhood planning process, that's very much low end. A lot of neighbourhood plans have cost upwards of some even close to £100,000. In addition to that, in, in, uh, in England, uh, local authorities are also given £20,000 at least per neighbourhood plan to provide support to communities producing them. Now, none of that seems to have been costed into the proposal at the moment, all of which will reduce capacity. And obviously, one of the other distinctive features of neighbourhood planning in England is that it's got a very variable geography. It's, it's happening in places typically that are much more socioeconomically wealthy and where there's higher capacity and it's not happening in other places. And if you don't want to reproduce that kind of geography, you need to think about very proactive mechanisms to avoid it, I think. Okay. Jenny Gorders, do you want to follow up on any of that? Thank you, Convener. Monica Lennon. Thank you, Convener. And I'll just briefly remind committee um, of my register of interest as I'm a chartered member of the Royal Town Planning Institute. Um, so good morning, everyone. Just a follow-up to, to Jenny's questions on local place plans. Um, you know, the bill um, is saying that community councils or other community bodies would have the power to produce a local place plan. I wonder if the panel has a view on whether the scope of that is, is correct. I note from um, the past submission, um, Petra, that um, PASS is suggesting that community councils as the only community group with a statutory role in planning should be required to take a lead role in any local place plan. And I'm thinking about areas in my um, region where there's there's big gaps in terms of community council coverage. So I wonder if um, the panel has a view on whether the, the bill has the scope right or um, are there areas across Scotland um, where there's perhaps not community councils or there could be other bodies that would be better placed to, to drive the local uh, place plan process? I think there's, there's two parts to this question because community councils, you're absolutely right, they are, they're very varied and the, the, the coverage is quite patchy. In many rural areas, there's actually, they're quite struggling as well. And there's also an ageing profile. But on the other hand, if you think of it in, in the purest sense of the word, they are the only democratically elected body at a local level. So to some extent, they are rooted in that, kind of, in that kind of function. And at the same time, that gives them to some extent the credibility. However, I wouldn't say it's exclusive community councils. I think we need to, all of us need to work much, much more to empower more community groups to work together. Development trusts have a big role, so have young people. There are many amenity groups, but I think if somebody has to drive and brings it forward, it has to be an elected body, that such as community councils. We had stressed in the, in the planning review that the role of the local the community council should be extended to be a statutory function within the development plan making. Unfortunately, that wasn't taken forward, but I think that's a very good opportunity to strengthen the role of community councils further. However, we are where we are, and I think it would be good not only to have a lead body, but actually to have a, a duty to include everyone within the community. Okay. Does Planning Democracy have a, a view on that? I, I, th I think broadly we would agree. I mean, I think that the, the, the role of community councils is very variable across Scotland, and it's not uh, a level of democracy which has been particularly well invested in over time uh, across the country, which means that it's very difficult. I think one of the 
things to think about in relation to local place plans, uh, which I personally would be very interested in, is thinking about where the local kind of anchor organisations and institutions are within local communities. And I think that's where you need to think about the, the uh, intersections with uh, community empowerment agendas, with local democracy agendas, and really thinking about where, where can you vest some kind of an institutional capacity which stays in and remains in communities. If you work in a lot of the, the disadvantaged communities in Scotland, for example, regeneration funding has tended to be project-based. Projects come, institution, organisations are set up, they run for the, the length of time of the project, and then they disappear. And there hasn't actually been the, the embedding of a, uh, an, an institutional organisational capacity at that level, which can be continuous, which would be the, the ideal kind of place to vest whether that's community council or something else, the ideal to vet, uh, place to vest that sort of a uh, local place planning process. McLeod, did you want to add? Yes, please, Briefly, thank you, Kimia. Um I think the question of uh, the, the, the types of organisations on the street that, that might be engaging in, in that process and have a potential lead role in terms of the, the local place plan is, is a pretty critical one, and there's variation in terms of that. And, and, and if, uh, Andy's absolutely right, of course, the... The role of, of community council is very important, but in some senses that has, has been challenging given the kind of hollowing out of their functions or, or their, their, their capacity in, in, in some instances. So I think certainly uh, there is some merit in, in thinking about other organisations that might be able to contribute or lead within the context of uh, developing the local place plans themselves. Uh, and in that context, certainly community landowners would be uh, potentially one type of organisation that may have a, would have a contribution to, to play in that, in that capacity. Not least because, uh, in uh, some contrast to other types of land ownership, they have a democratic, accountable role to play within that uh, process in terms of just the way they represent their membership and represent the community themselves in which they're, they're located. So having that linkage between um, organisational structures that are appropriate and community accountability and um, a, a democratic mandate in that sense is something which different organisations can, can play and certainly within that uh, pers uh, perspective community landowners uh, may have a, a role to play within that context. And Mr Cook? Yeah, I mean, certainly from uh, DTA Scotland's point of view we would certainly like to see this extended beyond uh, community councils. I mean for me um, it should be about um, looking at which organisations are actually driving local placemaking uh, and making sure that they are el eligible in, in, in certain respects. So if you take the example of the Community Empowerment Act, for instance, where you have got community bodies described with a certain range of characteristics, including democratic accountability, then a group that ticks these characteristics can, um, uh, can um, access various community rights. So I would like something similar um, produced or, or developed along the lines, along these lines, um, in terms of um, which community bodies are able to um, actually um, initiate and uh, uh, develop uh, local place plans. Can I just check in, lots of members want in to explore this further. So we're specifically talking at the moment because uh, Monica raised it with about what anchor organisations, community councils, for example, could drive some of that forward. So can I, can I just ask? It's not an either or. So in my area, there's a local community council that is as representative as it can be because you rarely have elections to become community councillors. So you have to debate that there's a democratic opportunity there, but there's not much voting goes on, let's be honest about it. So we've we formed a regeneration forum where we've invited a mapping exercise of anyone we thought were a community stakeholder, be it the housing association, be it a seniors forum, be at the local college, and getting them around the one table to meet every two or three months to start talking about local place planning and what that might look like. It's not an either or, is it? But so, so I see nodding heads. I wouldn't put that as a formal question. The question I would ask is, who should be doing the mapping exercise across our communities because where the black spots are? So again, Royston, my constituency, the big lottery fund had to go and do an exercise there because people weren't applying for lottery funds and it wasn't gaining them. So they identified where the black spots were in relation to community planning and community empowerment and community, act community activity. Should that be a duty on local authorities to identify where the weaknesses are in that community resilience and drive forward some of that? Because if we just wait for communities to do it, it might never happen. It might be in statute, but it might just never happen. Petra? That's quite an interesting point because, I mean, our, in our observation, there are different communities out there. And, and if we are too, you know, if you're just being too prescriptive, then we might just miss some opportunities. There are some communities, like, for example, the Isle of Rum, who, through a development trust, working, wanting to create their own place plan. They came to us, we helped them, 
Highlands and Islands Council declared it as a supplementary guidance, so it had some statue, which was great. They now can grow the community. So they're practical examples. But there are many other communities that just don't come together and don't feel the need. So I suppose there is to some, there's some element of a duty on local authorities to assist in that and finding this, this roadmap. But at the same time, don't be those communities that are already wanting to do something, and there are plenty of communities out there that have produced the equivalent of a local place plan. Glasgow is, is, is for example, one of them. So I think we shouldn't just be, um, you have to do it and you don't have to do it. I think there needs to be a, some sort of flexibility around this. Okay, any other thoughts on, on that, uh, Dr. McLeod? Just, just briefly, uh, I'm glad, by the way, Camilla, that you mentioned mapping uh, at the moment. Hopefully, we'll come back to that at some later point in this session for, for various other contexts. But um, I, th I think flexibility is the key here, that, that it shouldn't necessarily be on one particular organisation to, 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 to focus on and, and, and push this forward. So there is a role, of course, for local authorities to play in that, but there's also a role for, as Peth has said, for, for other organisations to, to help shape their own aspirations within the, 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 the places themselves and kind of balance that out. Any other comments before I let members back in? Dr Inch, did you want to...? Just very quickly, I think it's also important to, to think about local place plans as one tool amongst many for local place shaping. And then there's, a, there's an interesting question there around if you're sitting in a community and you're in, there's issues that you're interested, which of those tools are most appropriate for you to pick up and use at different points to, to try and achieve what you're interested in achieving? And it's not that everywhere needs a local place plan, but I think it's, it's important to try and think about, uh, about how that is, is presented to people in a way that makes these tools accessible. So whether that's in relation to community empowerment, whether it's in relation to community planning, whether it's in relation to things that come through uh, planning acts. And I think at the moment that picture doesn't really come together for a lot of people. I think it's, it's, that's a real challenge. So there's an issue there. Petra and then Ian Cook, and then I'm going to let some members come back in for other supplementary questions I, that they have on this. I would fundamentally agree, disagree with that place plan is seen as a tool to engagement. We have tools such as the place standard, for example, to drive a conversation around. But if the place plan is to be properly enacted and is part of the plan-led system, then it really is more than a tool. People to, to talk about their place and has aspiration and vision for their place. Very briefly, um, I think it does make sense in relation to the question that uh, local authorities could be responsible for mapping where there's gaps and where there's cold spots, etc. But I would like to think about where and how these cold spots might respond, because I think this has got to be bottom up. It's got to be communities we want to do something, etc. So the question is, how do you inspire communities to do that? How do you support them? How do you encourage them? How do you nurture them? Rather than trying to impose something from the top. OK, now, I am going to allow Monica Lennon back in, in a moment, Monica, but there's others with supplementaries on this specific point, and I'll let, let you come in again. Uh, Graham Simpson, something on this? Um, <coughs> well... I think you all agree that uh, the bill, as it's written, uh, on local place plans is, uh, doesn't have enough teeth um, when it says that councils only have to have regard to local place plans. That's pretty meaningless. Um, I think as a committee, we really need to hear you know, what the ideas are to sort that out. Um, I think, Petra, you said... Maybe it could, maybe uh, this could all be done at the time of the, the, the local development plan being being produced. Should it be perhaps a requirement on councils when they're producing those local place plans um, to reach out and engage with communities and then de uh, demonstrate in the evidence report that they have to produce that they've actually done that job, um, asked, asked for local place plans to be produced help people to produce them at the time of producing a local development plan? Right, so the end, I mean, we're talking about a local development plan moving towards a 10-year cycle. So there are opportunities within that to produce on a regular basis local place plans because communities are themselves uh, dynamic as well. I would say, yes, coming together right at the, at the, at the front and driving the local development plan, being informed by a local place plan is the best starting point and it's also a fusion then I'm being listened to I've identified these gap sites I've seen <clears throat> those empty homes and I want to do something with it and the intelligence and the information that a local community carries with it can only be beneficial for the for the local development plan yes uh, Dr Ange do you want to comment on that? 
Yeah. I think there's, there's a couple of very clear things. One would be that local place plans should clearly be part of the development plan, the statutory development plan for an area. And so, therefore, when a local place plan is approved, it becomes a part of the, the local development plan. But there's also an issue at the end of the process then, as I mentioned earlier. If communities are going to invest time and effort in producing a local place plan, they then have no guarantees that the decision maker on subsequent planning applications will, will really pay any heed in decision making. There's got to be a very strong case uh, there for those communities to have some kind of a right of appeal where decisions are contrary to what's been agreed in a local place plan. Having gone through that process, there's an, they effectively become the, the party that's produced the plan they should therefore have some, some say in subsequent decisions. And that would give them real teeth uh, and, and would be a real incentive to ensure that those local place plans were implemented. Any other comments on that? We are, we are going to have to move on beyond local place plans in a second. So if, if it's, is it a general agreement in relation to, to the point? Dr. McLeod, just come in and see Yeah, but very, say very, anyway. very briefly. The, the, I think that the actual key thing in, in relation to uh, the link between communities and local place plans and the, and the broader local development plan is actually front-loading that in the first place so that uh, the, the community's voice is, is listened to and actually is formally connected into the local development plan itself. So that, that link is there. And if you have that, you don't necessarily have to kind of uh, pursue um, a kind of third-party right of appeal in, in relation to that with, with regard to how that works in practice. So getting it this front-loaded is, is, is critical in, in that context. There's also the psychology of planning. If you know that you don't necessarily have to participate at this stage because you may have another bite later on. So I think we, we want to see much, much more engaged communities, engaged individuals creating local place plan at, a, at the earliest opportunity and knowing that it has statute, knowing that it has an opportunity for them to be involved, but it's meaningful, not tokenistic. I see hands up. There, there, there are follow-up questions we're going to have to ask as, 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 as MSPs and some of the the comments made. Mr Cook, you've not spoken in relation to this matter yet. Apologies that I'm not taking another witness at this point. Mr Cook, do you want to add something to that? For us, we would see the local place plan has been very much about or being very much part of community empowerment. I mean I think the idea that uh, communities can sort of proactively use the place plan when it's when it's when it's right for them to try and forward their ambitions is, is really kind of quite crucial, really. So I think we've got to be quite careful about. While I think it's important that when place plans are produced and they meet the criteria, then they are listened to and taken into account. Um, again, if it's just part of a kind of fairly kind of top-down bureaucratic system, we may flatten the sort of uh, activity, the the energy, the the enterprise that's already kind of bubbling away in communities. Also, in relation to this subject, Andy Whiteman and Kenneth Gibson has wanted to come in and ask a wee question. Can Kenneth? So, so much, I'll hold my fire. Right, OK. Andy Whiteman. So, just very briefly, Convener, um, I think one of our problems is we've gone out and we've spoken to communities, and like witnesses here today, folk think local place plans, yeah, that could be a great idea. Our challenge is to actually recommend to Parliament whether it is a good idea or not. Um, and as it appears in the bill, they, they are weaker than the English system. So I suppose the question for us is, if they are to be strengthened, how are they to be strengthened? So now Andy Inch has already said that he believes that they should be part of the statutory local development plan. Do others agree that they should be? It needs to be a duty. You, we, can't, we can't not have a, what, what we call a, a, a proper front-loaded, and this is a jargonistic term, but I think we all know what we mean by that, and proper community involvement to then just say, oh, well, we can't leave it, you know, at, at, at an opportunity. It has to be meaningful. And to get to have meaningful engagement means you have to give it teeth. And it means that, you you know, as a community, if I spend this time, if it, I spend my weeks and months helping and assisting and doing this, I know mm -hmm. it actually carries forward my views and they are being taken into account. So, yes, it has to follow. That is a planned system as we see NPF going down. We see local place plan being part of that. And there has to be a duty. Before, before other folk come in, cause there, is there a difference between a duty to consider local place plans and making it automatically part of a local development plan? Those are two separate things, aren't they? Um, and it's about how they rub together or how they complement each other. So I just want to be clear what witnesses are saying. Are witnesses saying that a local place plan that is approved by a local area. We've not defined what a community is. We've not defined what the threshold is. There has to be referendums for neighbourhood plans in England. We've not defined any of this criteria. Are we saying that no matter what, they should just automatically form part 
of the development plan or we say the development plan must show in a material and meaningful way have a duty to take consideration and account of them. So I want to make sure we're talking about the same thing when we go into make recommendations as a committee in relation to this. So what is it you're saying in relation to this, Petra, when you say a duty? I mean that you have to you prepare your local development plan, but you have to understand and fully be aware of what a local community and we have we have a sort of definition of neighbourhood if you look at community planning partnerships. We know roughly a geographical defined definition. I do think it needs to be very strong and it needs to be the local development plan has to take account of it. Yes, absolutely. It forms part of that plan led system cascading up the way. Okay. Um I think that's no, it's definitely an answer. I, I was going to be really honest. I, I think that's an answer. It's an answer, but it wouldn't be, it wouldn't automatically. This is really important, as, as, as my deputy convener just pointed out to me there. It has, will it have the same status in law as the development plan, or should the de development plan have a dispute resolution system, for example, when it doesn't match the local place plan? So, having that duty is one thing, automatically making it part of the, of the development plan is another thing entirely. So, I mean, I've got my own views on that, but I'm keen to know what the witnesses' views are. So, Petra, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to push you on this. Should it just automatically form part of the local development plan or should there be a stronger lever to have it influence the local development plan? Should it, for example, be a material condition, uh, a mere consideration in relation to planning applications if something goes against the local place plan. What do we mean by stronger than having regard to? The latter, because I think that it's very, very important that it is meaningful, that if you invest and you want to drive more demo democracy, democratisation of the plan-led system, that you want to have a material consideration of the local development of the local place plan in the development plan making. But having said that, we shouldn't, we shouldn't forget that as we're moving into a more in a system that is more uh, collaborative, we're actually not seeing the local, the local authority, plan making authority here and the local community here. We should actually work together so that they are aware of what's being proposed, they are aware of what's been happening, and then find it seamlessly going into the local development plan. But yes, I wanted the strongest possible, um, uh, given the strongest pro possible um, um, commitment to local place plans. I will take you back in a second, Dr. Inger Claire Simmons, I promise, but you, you, your organisation said that you think it should just be part of the development plan. Um, Petra's past seemed to be saying it should be a step removed from that, but should be influenced and feed into the development plan. Again, I don't want to put words into your mouth, I want to be clear about what you're actually saying. Um, if you're content with that, I'll ask Mr Cook or Dr McLeod what, what, what they feel about it. I'm saying it's stronger than that, it should be part of, it has to be a material consideration of the local development plan. So it will be yes. in the local development plan. Well, it, it follows, doesn't it? If you if you prepare something at a local level and you want to have it a meaningful and give it a, a proper statute, then yes, it has to be part of that. Right. So that's a yes. So you agree with planning democracy then? Okay, uh, Mr. Cook. Um, I suppose our view is that the, there definitely needs to be a, a stronger lever, as you've suggested, um, beyond what's currently in the draft bill. Um, I what, and I, um, what I tried to sort of um, allude to earlier on, I suppose, was a view that the statutory guidance needs to provide criteria which clarifies the different levels of sophistication of, that, that, of, that local development plans could take um, and that the different levels of legal status would attract um, depending on the criteria that the, 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 the local development plans. I suppose what we're looking for is something that is kind of organic. It's, it's much more about a, a power, um, but that once produced, if it meets the criteria, it must be regarded within the local development plan. It must be reflected within the local development plan. If it meets the criteria, Dr. Yeah. McLeod. Um, I think we're clear that it, it, the local development, the, the, the local place plan, does need to have a, a, a formal and clear link into the local development plan itself. And as, as Ian says, if whatever the criteria are in relation to that are met, that it, it, it ties in in relation to that. So, yes, a, a clear formal link within the context of what the local place plan does and how that fits within the local development plan. <coughs> okay, uh, Dr Inch, you like to, I think it'd be nice to move beyond local place plans as well, actually, because there's a huge amount in this. I think it's really important maybe to clarify how I understand talking about, everybody agrees that front-loading is a good idea, that a plan-led system is a good idea. Mm -hmm. Now, if, if something forms a part of the, the development plan as defined in statute, as I understand it, that, that means simply that it is a 
a material consideration that has somewhat more strength in decision making when it comes to looking at planning applications than other material considerations. The, the law says something like uh, the, the, the uh, decisions will be in accordance with the plan unless other, unless other material considerations indicate otherwise, or, or such paraphrasing. Um, so we're still talking about a relatively weak mechanism. One of the problems in Scotland is that when we talk about a plan-led system, we don't have one because decisions don't have to agree with what's in that plan when other material considerations indicate otherwise. And to, to, I think it'd be really interesting for the committee to consider if people are really serious about a plan-led system, I don't see anything in the bill which addresses this issue. And until you address that issue in a more fundamental uh, and meaningful way, which hasn't happened as far as I'm aware in any of the, the deliberations up till now, I don't think you can really talk very strongly about a plan-led system. You're always going to have that scope for the decisions at the end of the process not to be in accordance with what's in the plan. Just maybe a, a degree of patience there. We're trying to exhaust local place planning and yeah. move on to a whole myriad of other things, I can, I can absolutely assure you. But we have to be crystal clear what witnesses are actually saying when we come to form our opinions. Uh, so we're, it's, it's, it's maybe useful to clarify Sorry, the, the, the nature of the development plan and its, and, its, and its weight and the nature of including something as part of the development plan. What that means in legal terms, in strict legal terms, is quite an important point to clarify, I think. In front of us outlining that, I appreciate that, Dr. Inge, but we're trying to, we're still dealing with local place planning and we'll come on to that. Would anyone else, uh, um, Deputy Fiennes, would come back in uh, and I won't any other comments from where we are just now in local place plans before Monica comes back in? Okay, yeah. Yeah, just to wrap that up, so I take the points about, you know, are we trying to design a plan led system or not? Petra, probably about 10 minutes ago, you were talking about fusion where you could have local place plans being proposed alongside um, a local development plan being taken forward. Um, for me, as a sort of former practising planner, that does seem a bit odd because if we're trying to promote a plan-led system and we have a local place plan which would have the status of a material consideration, already there's tension there in the system. Um, the convener's talked about some of our external engagement and we had an event in Motherwell and John McNearney, the chief planner, came along and addressed community groups in Lanarkshire and he gave the example of, um, you know, we're shifting to a, a 10 year cycle or at least a 10 year cycle of um, local development plans and local place plans coming forward could indicate that the local development plan is in need of an update and a refresh. So is a local place plan an indication that the, the local development plan is, is out of, of kilter with what local need is and what local people want. Um, and if the chief planner is saying that local place plans could indicate the plan needs to be refreshed, does that not sort of send off alarm bells that move into a 10 year cycle is maybe not the best thing if we're trying to get that, that balance of, of you know, community buy-in and involvement and, and try to get certainty in the, in the plan? I would see it actually as something that is, is giving us a democratic renewal because if, if you're suddenly saying, uh, yes, we want to move to a 10-year plan because in, in Scotland we have been overwhelmed by constant plan preparation. You, you put it down and then you start the next cycle. And that can be quite, that can be quite uh, taking, taking away some of the, the vision, some of the aspiration and some of the delivery that we actually need to have. I would very much think that a local place plan has to be part of the local development plan process. It starts off with what the community wants. It's also very helpful because, don't forget that a lot of the local development plans are being signed off by the locally elected members. So there's a much better communication taking place than local development plan produced by the local community with their aspiration, with their vision for their place, and then being part of, forming part of the local development plan process. And yes, if there are new sites, we will always have changes within a 10 year, we have changes within a year. So if there's something that needs to be addressed again, again, we have the opportunity to go back with the community, fostering a new kind of dialogue, a new kind of engagement that we haven't seen until now. Can, can I ask, because if, if, the, if the, the idea is that the local place plan is a really good way to inform the development of your local development plan, I'm thinking about South Lanarkshire, where I live, so it's a big local authority. So at a neighbourhood level, you'd be talking about dozens upon dozens of local place plans if we were trying to get that at the right at the right scale. That could quickly become quite expensive if all these community councils and groups are, are bidding in to get funds to do a local place plan. In terms of front loading, is there just something missing in terms of how we do local development planning? Do we not need to direct resources to that instead? I don't know if Planning Democracy want to address that point. 
I, I mean, I think that we would say that it looks like the changes to the local development planning process moving to a 10-year cycle, uh, the loss of the main issues report, the watering down of the very positive suggestion I think that came out of the review panel to, uh, for a gate check process, which could have been a very interesting deliberative opportunity to involve communities uh, at the front end of the local development plan process, but doesn't look like that's how it's being taken forward at present. It looks like the local development plan is becoming less accessible to people uh, in, in relation to the changes which have been introduced. So the rhetoric around empowering communities, I'm not sure that that's followed through in terms of the mechanisms and the ways that local development planning process is actually changing. So one of the questions is kind of, where is the front end of that process for people to engage with and to input into? Uh, and you know, th there's, there's been a, a loss already following the 2006 reforms. There was, there was, uh, there's a lot less now examination and opportunity to examine local development plans before they're approved also. So the idea that you know, the local development plan and, and the, the capacity for people to engage with that and where those opportunities are is something that really needs to be looked at. The whole, keep your powder dry and all of that, we've naturally moved on to, to development planning. But can I just check, nodding of heads and a quick yes or a, a no will be fine, or a shrug of the shoulders, but can I just check, we think the promotion of local place plans is a good thing? Because I don't want that to get lost in all of this. Do we think it's a good thing? Vital. Yeah. If, you want right. to, if you want to change, it yeah. is vital. Right, OK. We, we think it has to be strengthened. The devil's, the devil's in the detail. Right. Well, is there devil in this? I mean, I mean, let's be careful with words here. Are local place plan, plans a good thing, Dr Inch? Should they exist? It, in principle, yes, but a lot of it will depend right. on the ways in which they're... Hold the, on to your the, optimism for a second here, <laughs> right? OK, right. You think... I don't, I don't want, to about, I want to be clear. You think they should exist. Should they be strengthened and more meaningful for communities? Is that what we're saying? Right. And then after that, it has to go further than just having regard to in terms of development planning. And the debate is now moved on, as far as I'm concerned, about whether you lift and shift and put it straight into the development plan or how it influences the development plan in a powerful and meaningful way. Is that a useful summary of where we are in relation to local place planning? Repeat the mistakes that we did in 2005-06, with where we talked about community engagement, but 10, 12 years later, we don't really have it. Now is an opportunity, and this, this committee, I think we need to give it a real tease for the local place plan to actually work well. Really helpful. Alexander Stewart, could you move us on? Thank you, convener. Thank you, panel. We've already touched on some of this, but I think I want to try and expand it a bit more. When we're, when we're talking about the potential removal of the requirement to produce a main issues report, uh, and what impact that would have in community involvement, Main issues report. Dr. Inch, yes, you put your hand up first. Be quicker, guys, next time. Yeah. I mean, I can do if others want to. I think, as I understand it, the main issues report was introduced to the 2006 Act, and the idea of that was very much in accordance with the, the principle of front loading and the desire to get people engaged early before a draft plan had been produced so that people could be involved in shaping the issues that would then influence a draft plan. I think the practice of the main issues report. Has, has been difficult and probably hasn't realised those aspirations. It's a difficult thing to get people involved in. Um, and I think that actually a very positive suggestion came out of the, the panel, that, the review panel that Petra uh, was, was a part of, which was the idea of a kind of evidence gate check. And going back 50 years to 1969, the Skeffington Report, the first time that public participation in planning gets mentioned, one of the things they were interested in was front-loading. We're still having the same discussion 50 years on, which suggests we've, we've not cracked that. But one of their things was to, check, to get people involved as far as possible in producing the evidence and in, and in being a part of deliberating on the evidence that would form the, the local plan. I think that the ways in which that gate check looks at the moment, it looks like it's going to be a very uh, a kind of... Uh, rather technocratic tick box exercise looking at uh, evidence handed on uh, down from on high rather than a chance for people to really deliberate about the kinds of evidence which should be taken into account in planning. So there's a need to get people involved at that uh, initial stage before there's a draft plan produced. And I think there's uh, scope to discuss. I think the expansion of the gate check would be a really interesting thing to discuss and how that could be made into a more deliberative uh, and, and engaged process. I, I welcome the, um, the move on from main issues report because I think up and down the country it has not really worked. We, most local authority produced something and then gave it out to consultation. That is not participation. That's, and to some extent it's almost you're inviting almost those that already know about the system to then be informed and then to get, get in, involved. So I think for me the local place plan is a much better replacement 
of uh, and a much stronger and it replaces the, the main issues report basically that that early consultation which we know has not worked because 10 12 years on we still have vast majority of people out there who don't know that there's such a thing as the planning system okay. Okay. dr mcleod the capacity and and space for communities to actually be able to engage in this process with regard to identifying what the main issues are in relation to the, the planning process and where they sit within that is, is fundamentally important. And I'm, I'm really interested in what Petra has to say there in relation to what seems to be almost an, an appropriation of expertise, if you like, on the part of, of, of professional organisations, professional planners almost, and other, others as well in relation to actually shaping, uh, identifying what the main issues are in relation to an area. And it's really important to kind of make sure that balance actually helps to, to enable communities to, to identify and, and help to, to push forward what they think the clear issues are within their places themselves. And that actually ties into broader issues which uh, relate to um, expertise and the appropriation of knowledge in that sense too, in relation to uh, issues around uh, landscape planning and the wild land aspects, which I hope we'll come into in terms of the wild land map and how that ties into our ideas of landscape and the key issues with regard to that, with regard to where we sit with it. So that, that's actually a broader but very important point, which ties into the main issues, identification and how that's communicated and mediated, and a lot of these kind of broader issues which tie into some of our aspects of our, our submission as well, I think. Okay. Other comments on that? Um, just very briefly, as I said, I'm, I'm not a sort of planning expert, so therefore don't know the sort of uh, the, the detail of this, but I, I suppose the kind of principles or the kind of issues that I would flag up were, I think, involving people as early as possible in the process is really crucial, as, 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 um, as Petra said. But it seems quite strange to me that we've got lots of evidence out there. I mean, there's, there's lots of evidence that could be fed into the plan system that's completely ignored at the moment. Communities doing plans. Now, a lot of these plans are more than just spatial plans. They're looking at things like economic, social, environmental development, etc. But there's information in there that could be uh, fed into to plans. So on the one hand, you've got the frustration that not that, that, that fewer people are involved in the, the planning process, but people are doing things themselves in communities that could be brought across. Um, so I, I suppose that's the the whole, uh, it takes you back to kind of local place plans, but it does seem to me that there's lots of information out there that could be drawn into the development of the, the plan. Any other comments on that, Dr. Lynch? Just, I mean, I'm very broadly in agreement. I'm not quite sure how local place plans replace the, the evidence gathering for the local development plan. The, and which is, I think, Petra suggested, I don't see how, because you're going to have a very variable geography, you're not going to have a take-up across the area, and that they're dealing with a very different geographical area. So I think you need to think about two separate processes there and, and not see the local place plans as a replacement for the main issues report or that early engagement in the, the local development plan process. I think that they're distinct. So Petra, could that only happen where they were aligned with each other and dovetailing in the first place, but where that wasn't happening? That was but the there, there, always will, there always will be a transition period. I mean, if we are facing out uh, the MII, if we are facing out the main issues report, then obviously that will take some time. But I should also uh, uh, alert the committee to a very good uh, handbook that was uh, created by NHS Scotland and uh, ANDS Scottish Government, and that's on the play, play, play standard, which gathers a lot of information around local plays, engaging the, the, the local community to think wider than just about the... It's about the well-being and how you feel about a place, and that is by many by captures data that local uh, authorities actually then can access to plan for the future. So there are lots of different ways how we now in this digital age actually ga gather information around local communities and that around local neighbourhoods. Okay, so we were just we're still on the main issues report, uh, Monica. I just want to make make, make sure because the question was around you know the removing of it, and so I just want to stay focused so we're getting the views and how, how you feel. Uh, Petra was, was fine with that. Dr. Inch, what, what was your views on that? I'm not sure we, 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 we got concrete views. So would you keep it? No, I, I, I would be very interested in how you uh, adapt and develop and augment the proposed gate check and turn that into a deliberative okay. opportunity for people to engage. So, that, so that's helpful. So it's fine if it goes, but we have to really beef up the gate check and make it more than a bureaucratic tick boxing exercise, as you were kind. Of, and I see Dr. McLeod nodding in that. Do you want to add anything yeah, to that? Yeah, I mean that, that's absolutely critical. These should not be uh, technocratic um, exercises where where the, the process is being shaped from the top down, effectively, or essentially. It needs to be something which is deliberative and enables communities to actually. Um, 
have a voice and, and help shape that process itself. Because ultimately, you know, what are the main issues that are affecting community? They have a, a, a real voice and, and, and an awareness of that, and they need to have the capability and the roots in and the mechanisms to enable that to happen effectively. Okay. Um, Claire Simmons? Um, yes, uh, you, you mentioned about alignment, and I think uh, you know the, the fact that the local place plans might have to align with uh, w what is in the development plan, and that with the national planning framework becoming part of that development plan, that creates a real tension uh, for you know whether it's top-down planning or bottom-up, and that's something that needs to be bottomed out, and that's something that we've asked that you retain the national planning framework as a national-level document, because otherwise there's going to be a, a, a difficult tension between those. I promise you, if I move things on a bit quicker, we will eventually get to. Is there any other comments in the main issues report than Alexander Stewart to finish off this line of questioning? Okay, Alexander Stewart. Can I can I just tease a bit more about the gate check? You you've identified that that you believe this is a a potential that could be used quite extensively, uh, and and the community involvement in that process is vital. Uh, and 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 what should kind of evidence should the community be taking into effect? Uh, and what should we be looking at uh, if that gate check is going to be quite well advanced and can actually benefit uh, in what you're trying to achieve? I love it when you all look at each other <laughs> and, and, no, and no one actually volunteers to answer. <laughs> Dr. Dr. McLeod, can I possibly volunteer to answer? Yes. Yes. I mean, there, there are very many, of course, uh, issues that, that could be taken into account in terms of evidence, but things like housing need, for example, uh, specifically affordable housing need, uh, scope to increase population within uh, a, an area itself, if we're talking particularly within well, uh, an urban, but specifically within a, a rural context. So thinking about these kind of expressed, and there are others as well in terms of services and, and, and various aspects with regard to uh, types of development, but actually these kind of uh, express uh, community ambitions and objectives that actually relate very clearly to their sustainable development and their cohesion. So that, that, that would be a pretty fundamental part of that, I think, certainly. And there'll be others. But it's, it's about having the, the, uh, enabling communities to have that voice and capacity to do it. See, if you all want to answer a question and you try to work out who it is, the first person to look at me gets to answer the question, just as a rule of thumb, Dr Inch. Yeah, I think there's also a question there about the form that that might take. I think we'd be very interested in the possibilities of that looking to something like a citizen's jury, for example, or different models of de deliberative innovation that could be brought in to enable different forms of, of, of hearing of evidence and taking of evidence. And then, as was pointed out earlier, that there's, there's existing plans and strategies and huge amounts of existing evidence which could be brought before a process like that and could be sifted uh, to, to identify priorities and people could be taken through a, a process to identify priorities that would then feed into the, the plan. I think there's a lot of different uh, models and ways of, ways of, of organising that, that that would be uh, a lot more interesting than uh, you know, a, a kind of a, a checklist of... Uh, of existing statistical evidence, you know, you've got to kind of try and enable people to engage with that. And, and I, I believe that would probably engage much more, and people would be much more alive to the whole process if they saw that as an opportunity for them to participate. Hopefully, yeah. I think the, the reason the gate check was proposed in the first instance was to allow greater community sign off, basically, of the local development plan. We also proposed a two-stage gate check because it is. If, you were, if you're real about front-loading, then you give it time and you have to invest time in that because there, will, there are, and that's the, the, the beauty about the planning system, you have lots of different values, you have lots of different vested interests and you've got to balance that. We also wanted to get away from the notion that it is a remote reporter that does the final sign-off. And really, this is driving democracy back into the local community. So the, the gate check is absolutely vital. Having mediation as part of that in order to then find out, you know, what is it the community wants over here? And by the way, n n very few communities speak with one voice. There are lots of different communities and lots of different uh, interests in there. And there's also the developer, be it a small scale like the Development Trust or, or larger scale, housing associations, gypsy travellers who are never in the process. So we have to think very hard that we are resourcing that properly. But the idea was to go hand in hand as this planning, this new planning bill is to be more uh, collaborative, more inclusive, we've got to find ways of doing that and we've got to invest time in that as well. Okay. Um, just make any other comments on that before we move on to the next line of question? I'm just giving a heads up to Mr. Whiteman, who's got the next line of questioning there. Any other comments on, on gate checks in the community? No, okay. Mr. Whiteman. 
Uh, thank you, Convener. I want to ask about um, uh, simplified development zones. So we've had simplified planning zones, of which I think there are two. Um, these are to be got rid of and we're to introduce simplified development zones. Uh, places where uh, there will be a lot of upfront planning, um, not just in terms of spatial dimensions, but roads consents and infrastructure, such that these areas become essentially development ready um, zones um, and no requirement to apply for detailed planning consent in them. Um, I've got sort of two lines of questions. I mean, the first is the matter of principle. Um, should should they exist? And the second will be about, you know, some of the detail. But on, on should they exist, I mean, I note, I think, um, evidence from uh, Professor Cliff Haig, who will be coming in uh, later, basically saying that this is the ultimate in upfront planning. And in a sense, if it is upfront planning, we should be doing it right across Scotland. Um, so I'm just wondering, on the panel's views on the merits of these schemes and whether they believe that they, they, they have potential to deliver better outcomes for Scotland's communities. Dr McLeod. I think in answer to your question as to the merit of them, I think Community Land Scotland would believe that there is merit in uh, the, the model, the approach, depending on what they're designed to achieve and for whom they're designed to achieve it effectively. So from, well, to take the area of, of, of this that I represent, obviously, if you have a community landowner, for example, uh, which, which is, has, has aspirations to see particular types of development, be it more affordable housing, be it uh, other types of, 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 of business development or so on, if they are in a position where they can actually um, shape that process uh, in, in ways which, again, to come back to the previous points about issues and, and identifications of objectives, if they are, 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 are shaped in ways which enable the community to actually fit its aspirations with the type of development that's going on uh, and, and can help to, to do that, then clearly there's, uh, from our perspective, uh, some considerable potential merit in, in relation to what the zones actually achieve themselves if they are designed to actually uh, contribute to the sustainable development, economic, socially and environmentally in relation to uh, the, the communities themselves. And within that context, if I can just extend this slightly, um, there's some considerable uh, merit as well in relation to thinking about, particularly within a rural Scotland context, where uh, the potential for uh, development that is sustainable, economically, socially and environmentally, might actually be undertaken. So that can include, as we've suggested in our, our submission, uh, thinking about resettlement and repopulation of uh, areas where there are no longer existing human communities. So there's a, a potential um, application of these types of, of mechanisms within that context of thinking about how we can balance uh, the renewal of rural Scotland at the community level and, and how uh, these sort of me mechanisms can actually help to, to, to pursue that, really, and, and balance that out in terms of competing at this, so that uh, local communities and people within uh, landscapes and within communities actually have um, a clear and um, prominent position in terms of actually shaping what happens within the communities themselves. Yes, thank you. Dr Inch? Yeah, I mean, I think that we I talked earlier about the, the plan-led system and zoning is the sort of alternative to the discretionary planning, which we have in Scotland typically, where the decision doesn't necessarily follow what's in the plan. In, in zoning-based systems, which exist throughout most of the rest of Europe and uh, US and sort of bro broadly around the world, the, the, what's zoned in the plan is, is, is legally uh, constrains what can be built, which is effectively what we're talking about, introducing some zoning into the Scottish planning system, which I, I think is potentially uh, an, an interesting development and something that's worth experimenting with. Uh, I have reservations uh, around the description of them as simplified development zones when why are they not just being called better planning zones? Why isn't it about getting it right up front to ensure that you're getting the highest quality of development, that you're getting the highest quality of engagement, you're getting the highest quality of consideration of environmental constraints and factors, and you're ensuring that what you're laying out is zones to produce really high quality settlements. And I think if you, if you allied that to some other mechanisms uh, around, for example, uh, um, 
compulsory purchase and uh, land assembly on the part of public authorities, you could begin to think about zones to really innovate and produce uh, sort of the capacity to really deliver development. At the moment, we have a very reactive uh, planning system. We produce plans and then wait for uh, the market to decide if applications will come forward that will enable those plans to be uh, implemented. There's that sort of more positive, proactive zoning system, we potentially also have mechanisms to ensure the implementation of, of those plans. But it's really important to get that upfront uh, process right if you're going to do that, because the plan becomes uh, much more definitive. And if there's not proper engagement, if there's not proper consideration of all the factors, and there's not a real drive for quality, then uh, they're, they're not going to work, and they're going to sell the future short. Thank you. Petra? Yeah, just, um, when we looked at, uh, in, the, in the review, when we looked at uh, the, the zoning, and I, I agree, I don't like the terminology, uh, simplified development zones. We did want to call it investment-ready areas because it really is uh, an area that has gone through all the, all the discussions, has had the community buy-in in terms of it's uh, been discussed with the community and there's engagement around that. And it's wider than just than just uh, uh, areas of land. This also can be applied to uh, struggling town centres, for example. So we have we only got two in Scotland, where there are hundreds in in England. And there is a I think there is a need to think differently about how we, again, engage upfront with the, the the whole sort of dilemma of where we where we building, what we building, and again I think what the this uh, area, the zoning allows us is also to be a bit more creative of the kind of housing that maybe we want to build, uh, have more varied housing models, uh, maybe invite more smaller and local developers to come forward. So again it's it's an it's a great opportunity and I think we want to see more of those happening. Okay, other views around that? Anyone else? Ian Cook? to a, a more sort of proactive public sector led development then we would be, we would be supportive but it's not an area that we have sufficient information around to make an informed comment okay. dr mcleod do you want to add anything don't feel the need to add if you don't want to but opportunity to talk to mcleod to <laughs> <laughs> um it, and it's really around um from a, you talked about the urban context, and that's obviously very important, but when we're talking about the, the rural context, something that seems quite clear from, from this bill and certainly some of the, 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 the material contained in the policy memorandum, it's very urban-focused. Uh, th there's a lot of focus on, on town centres and, 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 and urban context. That's very important. There's no, no, absolutely no getting away from that. But what's also important as well is how we actually conceptualise and think about rural Scotland and the development of rural Scotland and where planning actually sits within that context. Uh, and if we're thinking about um, development in a sustainable development um, perspective, we need to think about how that sits uh, in relation to where people and communities actually have a role to play in, in relation to that. So uh, thinking about simplified development plans, thinking about the kind of mechanisms and, and ideas for policy that we have in relation to uh, rural renewal in Scotland, what the planning process might play in relation to that is, is important with regard to um, ideas around where we want to have communities, how we want them to prosper and, and, and how that sits. And so thinking about resettling and, and repopulating uh, and where mechanisms such as this plan, uh, this this uh, process might sit amongst a host of other issues is, is very important and, and worth not losing sight from, of in, in, in the policy context broadly, but also specifically in relation to this uh, bill. And I, I think, sorry, can I just, just that, I think that articulation of, you know, urban and, and rural is, is best defined through a community-owned local place plan so that we can distinguish between the different communities and the different drivers within each. Okay, Mr Heitman. Very much. Thank you very much for that. Um, I, I was intrigued with your answer, Dr. McLeod, in the sense that the planning system um, is a system of spatial planning, um, but you represent people who also own land, so can deliver. Um, so in a sense, it's what you're saying that simplified development zones together with local place plan, together with the fact that you own the land and can then deliver it, is something that that fusion could work for you. Um, or are you saying, particularly in that context, are you saying that more broadly speaking, in rural Scotland, simplified development zones could have a useful role to play as well. Certainly from a community land owner perspective, the, the, the combination of owning the asset and, and the, the other components that you mentioned there, the land asset, is, is an incredibly important, powerful tool in relation to how you uh, develop the, the sustainability of a community itself. We've seen examples of that throughout 
Scotland, certainly in the Highlands of Scotland and elsewhere, you, you can just go back go to where I'm from in, in, in Harris, in the West Harris Trust, and how they've actually repopulated there, how they've actually de delivered jobs and, and, and employment opportunities and other kind of services as well. So that combination of owning land, being able to manage it for the community is fundamentally important in terms of unlocking opportunities uh, for uh, sustainable development in that way. So, so, so that's a critical element. But, the, but also, to come back to your second point, um, there is potential elsewhere in, in Scotland and other, other contexts to think about how uh, that mechanism can, can be used in a proactive, sustainable fashion. And a lot of that is stuff that we've already traversed in terms of the, the, the terrain of this discussion today around how you front load processes, how you give communities a voice and the kind of practical elements of how, how you actually do that. Okay, so my second line of question really is, is really about how the power is framed uh, here. So this is um, local author planning authorities can introduce a scheme. Third parties can request a scheme. Um, if that scheme is refused by the authority, the third party can appeal to ministers. Ministers can alter a scheme. They can give directions how to formulate a scheme. Um, they can force a local authority to have a scheme. Do you think that the balance of power here is correct um, with such powerful ministerial powers to deliver what is in essence, a local um, zone of the plan. I think, broadly speaking, that's that's one of a, a range of examples of quite centralising measures in the bill that take a lot of a lot of new powers for the Scottish government to, uh, which already has really we have a very centralised planning system as it is, uh, and there's a considerable greater centralisation. Uh, I think that if you're going to think about sensible planning, you think about where it's where it's vested, and it's vested in local, locally democratic authority, uh, democratic elected authorities. Seems like a good place to vest those powers, and I, I think that uh, that there's not necessarily any need for for all of that level of uh, of, of central uh, control and potential coercion to to designate um, simplified development zones, which should be seen as a part of the uh, the, the the local planning process. Okay, thank you. Other comments on that? No other comments? We, we, we do have a supplementary in relation to that, Andy, um, from Graham Simpson. Yeah, um, the flip side of that is if uh, national government decides that we need more towns, for example, then uh, the use of this method might be one way of achieving it. Um, and you could have councils all over the country saying, not here, but when we know we need more building, um, is it not is is it not right that government should should be able to say, well, we need towns there, there or there? The flip side of that, uh, but it's a, a related point, and it, 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 we're flipped about round again. Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 flip, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. There could be, be lots of flip sides. No, I know. Absolutely. Sorry, sorry, forgive me, Doctor McLeod. Forgive me. Um, um, Certainly, if there is a, a, a kind of aspiration to um, create new towns, uh, and, and there are, are, there's, there's, there's seen as a policy need for that, and it fits in in terms of, of um, kind of clear policy objectives within sustainable development, economic growth, and so on and so forth, uh, then certainly there's there's potentially a case to be made with regard to that. So it, it, that, that's the answer to that question. And, the, and, and that's very important as well, forgive me, in relation to uh, the, the rural context too. So if there's a clear public interest case to be made in relation to uh, repopulation or resettlement for the kind of cohesion and um, uh, sustainability of, of rural Scotland, uh, north and south, the highlands and, 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 and lowland Scotland, um, the, the, the powers to actually enable that to happen with regard to repopulation and resettlement is, is something that in our evidence we have very much uh, advocated. And if there's a kind of public good in, uh, interest in doing that, then that's certainly something that, that should happen. And, and there's been a, a lot of kind of media attention around our um, submission with regard to that particular aspect in terms of repopulation and, and resettlement. Um, to be absolutely clear, what we're not advocating from a community land Scotland perspective is kind of pressing reset on the Highland clearances. What we are suggesting is actually thinking about ways that are imaginative and uh, forward thinking with regard to how we um, conceptualise 
the planning process and, and planning policy with regard to thinking about the actual sustainability of rural Scotland and where repopulation and resettlement and all the infrastructure and, and kind of elements that go with that might actually sit in practice. So I'm, I'm very glad that you raised that. Thank you. A couple of other witnesses want to comment on that. Dr. Lynch, were you wanting in on that? No, uh, Petra. Did you? No, no, no okay. You're okay. I just want to say, if, if we, we have to think imaginatively about about uh, um, simplified development zones, and I mentioned earlier that we have one in town centre here in Scotland. Currently, I mean, we're talking about new towns, but currently we have over 30,000 empty homes. Most of them, and they're, they're houses in some areas, most of them are in town centres. Now, we need to find some sort of mechanism to unlock them and to repopulate our, our town centres, which are increasingly struggling. Now, again, if we think uh, imaginatively about how we apply that, then maybe we could actually find a way of unlocking the potential that has, that is already in Scotland, without actually building, before we start thinking of new towns. We have, I think that the latest, uh, the latest uh, statistics is 32,000 empty homes, which is a huge number, when you think about it. Okay. I'm just wondering, before we move on, because it's a... Graham, do you want to follow up on that, first of all? It, it was... I had another question on simplified development zones. Right. Yeah. Run with that just now, then. That's OK. Um, so, at the moment, uh, simplified planning zones can't be built in certain areas. They can't be set up in certain areas. Uh, Greenbelt conservation areas and uh, national scenic areas. The, the bill, as it currently stands, doesn't specify that. Um, do you think it should? You're all looking at each other again. Um, Dr. Lynch. I, I think what we said is that, is that all the inputs to any designation of a zone need to, to all be there before we'd have any confidence in the mechanism. And one of those key inputs would be looking at existing constraints and designations. Um, I think that, uh, you know, there's... there's so, so, yes, I think that it, it, um, draw, drawing the power less broadly... Uh, may, may help to, to limit the, the remit of simplified development zones, but the, the alternative would be, uh, as it is, but ensuring that the, the more important, ensuring that the inputs that go into the designation of any zone uh, are, are, are clear and we'd take that, that into account anyway. Dr. McLeod. Uh, in terms of designations and, and, and where the, the zone should actually be, there's a real issue, frankly, particularly in rural Scotland, with regard to um, issues around wildland mapping in particular and wh where that s sits and, 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 and ties in with development. Uh, you know, there's a lot to be said clearly in terms of, of issues around wild land itself, but what is, is, is really important is that you don't actually, as, as currently the wild mapping process I think has done, uh, you, you airbrush uh, people's kind of people out of that process effectively, uh, so that uh, ideas of kind of wild land are really socially constructed sort of approaches where uh, you've actually had human populations and settlements previously. So kind of changing that balance and getting that um, kind of balance correct or, or, or more appropriate in terms of, of the, the relationship and place of people in landscapes and helping to define landscapes is, is very important as part of that process. And that's partly what our uh, map of no longer existing communities is designed to help uh, move along in policy terms. Graham, anything? No. Can, can I just check, because I thought Andy White's question was really quite interesting in, in relation to the range of ministerial powers in relation to designation of, 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 of these zones. I'm just wondering, is that a power that you would hope would never be exercised in terms of dictating? But could there be an example of other things in the planning system are not working like, so local place plans haven't been able to influence the local development plan and the planning authority seems out of step with the needs of communities, that there, there, there could be the need for government to exercise some of those powers that Mr Whiteman understandably had concerns about? Is it the kind of power you'd like government to hold but not necessarily ever have to use if everything else worked out? Or does there have to be a bit more safeguards about when the powers would be actually be exercised? In that context, it's, it, it's um, potentially a sort of backstop power, effectively. And you, you get that actually in other areas of land reform, community ownership, for example, where you have uh, powers uh, in relation to... Um, developing community ownership. So the idea that if there's a policy aspiration at the, na at, at, at 
w within uh, public policy arena to actually achieve particular objectives, whether it's repopulation, resettlement, and, and all that goes with that, and there's a community aspiration to, to do that, uh, that would be a potentially important kind of back, backstop power with regard to it. Although, in our submission, we're obviously talking about um, some, some other upfront powers as well in terms of compulsory purchase and so on with, with regard to land. Okay, thanks for putting on the record. Dr. Lynch, last comment on this, and then we'll move on. Well, those backstop powers already exist to call in applications, to uh, to recall appeals, uh, there's oversight over local development plans, and generally speaking, some, some of that central control is okay. One of the other mechanisms I think, of centralisation that's, that's proposed at the moment, though, is that the national planning framework, which will be combined with spatial planning policy, will become a part of the development plan, as we discussed earlier, meaning the development plan will be that national planning framework alongside the local development plan. Now, that considerably strengthens and changes the nature of the national planning framework, actually, in quite a worrying way, which means a much more direct influence in planning decision-making than currently exists. In, in, uh, so I think that there's, uh, there, are, uh, there are questions around the, the kind of backstop powers, but then there's also, it seems to me, a creep towards more, more uh, directly interventionist powers uh, w within the bill, which uh, should be of concern. Okay, some more of that, just a time check. We've probably got another 45 minutes or so left for this evidence session. We said we've quite, we've been quite a long session. We want to get through every area of the bill, so th thank you for... Uh, for that, just, just to give you an idea how long we have left. Uh, Monica Lennon. Uh, thank you, convener. Well, I think I'm looking at the clock. We've been discussing the bill now for about 90 minutes, and I guess we haven't really talked about what is the purpose of the planning system, and possibly that's because the bill doesn't actually say what the purpose of, of planning is. So I know from your written evidence, both pass and Planning Democracy are calling for the bill to be amended to include a statutory purpose for the planning system. Can I put that to, to uh, Planning Democracy and pass first of all, but why do you think that's important for the bill to be explicit about the statutory purpose of planning? Okay. Um, ever reliable, uh, Dr Inch is, is first to catch my attention. Uh, catch is not. Interesting. Okay. Uh, uh, no. Uh, so I think that when the, the planning system that we have is largely unchanged since 1947, when it was introduced, uh, there's kind of an assumption that the, the purposes were, were, well, the purposes were assumed to exist. It was assumed to be a common purpose uh, for, what, for what planning is. And so it was never included in the legislation. And there's similar debates uh, in, in England as well around the lack of a purpose. Uh, so when we talk about the planning system needs to deliver which is, seems to comes up a lot in a lot of pe people's written evidence. There's very much less discussion of deliver what, <laughs> and so th there's there's a kind of a, a missing element there, which is well, wh what what do we want planning for, and and to have a really positive purpose for the planning system would enable uh, all decision making to be tested against uh, a clear idea of the kinds of positive place making purposes, uh, the public interested purposes that planning should be serving. Um, and I think that could, that could provide a really interesting power to test plans against. I think plans are currently do have a, a, the purpose of contributing to sustainable development, I think, under the 2006 Act, but only plans rather than the system as a whole. Um, and I think that uh, having a very clear definition of what those purposes are uh, would, would, uh, would help to clarify uh, how we understand planning and could create a very strong public interest purpose for the system and its operation. So would you agree that it does seem odd that the bill doesn't articulate that? And if we are trying to get more people, the wider public, involved in planning, do we not have to really spell out the whole point of this and, and what planning is, is for and, and why it matters to people? I think it's really important, and, and we have made submission to that effect. We need to know, is it about sustainable economic growth? Is it about a place agenda where everybody has a right to be participating in it? So the purpose has to be absolutely defined. And I think that will help then to drive much more people's thinking around this is planning is just a regulatory function to planning is actually a visioning and you're part of that. So a, 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 definitely a strong statement as to what is the mission of planning. Thank you. Now, Petra, you might have more insight than most on the panel because you were involved in the independent review. But, you know, do you have any sense of, of why the government hasn't um, included the statutory definition in the bill because it seems pretty fundamental to everything else that's been discussed today. I think to some extent we didn't make a recommendation and because we were very much focusing on how do we better the, the, the planning system as it was, how do we ensure that there's more front-loading, how do we ensure that we have a, a more um, 
constructive and integrated uh, planning system and one that can cover, go with other policy areas. So to some extent, I guess, probably in hindsight, we certainly have submitted since then, a, uh, from a past perspective, um, how, what, how we would like the vision of, planning to, of, the, of the planning system to be articulated. Point about I, I think Dr. Cook, what is Dr. Cook, sorry, uh, Dr. McLeod. Yeah. Ian Cook, you can comment as well, but Dr. McLeod can try to get in, Monica. Sorry, Mia. Dr. McLeod. Um, one thing that's very noticeable when you read through um, the, the, the bill uh, and the policy memorandum is it's, it's very process orientated. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that there isn't actually a vision or a, a clear articulation of what the purpose of the planning system is on the face of that bill is, in our view, an omission. Because if you don't have that, how can you expect when, when the legislation goes out and, and all that comes with it beyond that actually um, goes out into, into, into the broader environment, how can you expect people to have any purchase or traction in relation to how they relate to planning as a process and as a policy area itself? And so it's really important, we would argue, from a Community Land Scotland perspective, to uh, actually have that articulation with regard to what the purpose of the planning process is. Well, what is it? It's about, um, broadly, uh, making sure that uh, rural and urban Scotland are sustainable in, in their various aspects, socially, economically and environmentally. It's about giving communities a voice in terms of actually how that process works and making sure they're consulted with and actually have an opportunity to, to achieve um, and, and shape their places themselves. Uh, and it's about as well thinking innovatively, we would argue, and imaginatively about uh, the, the, the kind of the balance of development and sustainable development within uh, particularly the, the rural context. So clearly we've, we've argued in our submission uh, for uh, a duty for uh, ministers to have a regard as to the desirability for repopulation and resettlement within um, future policy. We think that would be really useful to have something that in, the fa in relation to that in the face of the bill and also to tie that into uh, the evolving kind of policy framework within the, the national policy framework and other areas as well and, and elements of that. So keeping that front and centre in terms of what this uh, process of planning is about and for helps to articulate and shape a lot of what, uh, what, what comes from that. Andy wants to come back in, but what I was going to ask um, Petra before Dr McLeod uh, came in with another question was another reason why this might be important is the bill tries to address performance and has things to say about how we would get better at um, measuring the performance of planning. If we don't really know what the value base is and, and what the vision is and what the purpose is, this, um, you know, the measures that are proposed on performance, are they going to be meaningful and are they going to take us anywhere because we're still measuring how long things take but we're not really looking at outcomes and we've talked a lot about about placemaking um i think dr Inch was wanting to come in but i just wanted to yeah. absolutely explore that we, a wee bit we, further we, we have a variety of witnesses all wanting to come in dr oh, yeah. Inch will take you in a second but petra you first and then dr Gosh. <laughs> so I think I think it's absolutely important that we set out the purpose, and I think uh, the people, the alliance of people and places, we have made submission to that effect. We want to see a purpose of the planning system. What is it all about? So that people really, right from the start, understand that. And the second part of the question, in terms of, um, um, sorry, I forgot. Sorry, Monica, could you remind me? So there's the performance. Yeah. Yes, there's another very important point that we have made within the alliance. Uh, uh, we, f we feel that the performance should be extended to how community engagement is taking place because I think it's really, really vital that as part of the performance measuring, uh, we see an, a move towards engaging with community is absolutely, absolutely important if we want to uh, enshrine the spirit of the new planning bill. So that see, needs to be part of it. On that point, because um, I'm a bit of a planning geek, as people um, possibly know. Now, earlier on, Petra, you said that the majority of people still don't know um, there's such a thing as a planning system. I was looking back at, at your evidence on the 2006 Act um, and you said more or less exactly the same thing. So it's quite depressing to think that we haven't really seen progress. So is, is there a way to better capture what's happening in a local area or a local authority in terms of uh, what that engagement strategy is? And are we able to really kind of a quantify what people know or don't know about about planning? We have a 
huge opportunity now for the first time to actually set it right because in 2005 when evidence was gathered and when we were pushing for better engagement we got the main issues report as part of the early engagement and of course that is rooted in in a language that the average person out there just is not is not uh, uh, um, conversant with nor have we have we sold what planning is all about is around the vision of a place and us actually also addressing societal needs, whether it's affordable home, whether it's uh, an a dealing with an aging population, future-proofing our housing stock. All of these are captured, or now climate change, of course, all of these are really have to be captured by the planning system, by the, by the place agenda. It's so important. If we then start talking in the language of the ordinary person out there, we're talking about place, and everybody is passionate about place. Everybody's passionate about how the children go to school, how we will age, but in a, in a healthy environment. So we need to think, rethink almost the language of planning as well so that we can actually translate what it's, what it's to, for everybody, and that is about how do we deal with a good functioning place. So yes, 10 years on, I, 12 years on, I'm actually really, really frustrated that we still haven't got it right, but we have an opportunity now. Um, I just really wanted to reiterate uh, what other people have said and thank Callum for uh, mentioning about it being process-oriented, uh, uh, the bill. Um, and I think that one of the purposes of planning, uh, to have a purpose of planning, is, is really important because then you can measure, use your planning performance uh, measures to measure outcomes, not just about measuring process. Um, also, uh, you know, to start measuring things more qualitatively um, rather than focusing on performance figures around speed and efficiency. Um, we need to see far more um, performance measures. Uh, they might not be so easy to measure. They're not so quantifiable, perhaps, but um, there has been talk in the past with the heads of planning about introducing measures um, to, to assess performance on you know how you how well you engage your community and i think that needs to be thought about uh, possibly not for the actual bill but later on in the just to add something to that just very briefly i mean um you'll see that uh, from our submission we didn't comment on this but um, i would totally agree with the um need for the articulation of purpose i mean it just seems to me an absolute kind of prerequisite pre uh, prerequisite if we want to actually engage communities more effectively and also want to measure performance should be an and or or situation but in terms of the the purpose of planning i know that um separately the royal town planning institute in scotland are advocating that there should be a chief planning officer so i'm wondering if part of this is there's maybe a lack of um leadership within local authorities because um you know it's not about just looking at individual planning applications it's about looking at planning strategically and the resource behind that for for infrastructure but we've seen between 2009 and 2016 in scotland a 23 percent reduction on average in the the planning workforce and i think in terms of planning service budget on average it's around a third of a cut so there's a lot of high level talk about the importance of planning but are we seeing that backed up by resource and um, leadership at a corporate level and a political level, locally and nationally. I think we've also under the alliance again. I've got to be a part of, a, of an alliance that has now 18 organisations, ranging from Play Scotland to NHS. All we're saying is we want to have a planning system that is really meaningful. And within our submission, we did say that we would like to see chief planner in each local authority, but more than that, actually a commissioner about planning in place so that we bring together the alignment between community planning and spatial planning. If you look at the planning system as preventative spend, or if you look at it as an investment tool, then really the planning, the planning system is incredibly important. Preventative spend, if you're building the right kind of houses in the right lo location, we're actually staving off loneliness, and we're currently in discussion with NHS Scotland. If you look at it in terms of an investment plan, then you really, it goes back to the simplified planning zones that we mentioned earlier. This is about attracting investment of the right kind into Scotland. So, Planning is much, much more, but it hasn't been seen in that entirety and in, in its, its, uh, its aspiration and what it actually can do to help Scotland to meet its ambition as a nation. Do is anyone else who wants a comment on that, absolutely, please come in and then we'll move on to the next line of questioning just for time constraints. Claire Simmons, you've indicated you want to make a comment on that. Yeah, 
Yeah, it was just a it was just a short point about you know resources and um, yeah, as you said, Monica, the reduction of planning offices and the impact that that has. Also, the way you measure things, um, for example, participation statements um, that the local authority have to uh, write before they carry out their engagement uh, activities, and they are measured on whether or not they comply with that uh, participation statement, not whether or not that what they did was useful and, and meaningful. Um, and so a lot of the planning officers in a meeting that I went to have said that they keep what they say they're going to do in the p participation statement to a minimum because they know that they're not going to achieve it if they, if they do something more ambitious and creative. So you're stifling creativity by the old performance measure, if you saw what I mean. So just to make that point. Any other comments on that before we move on? I, I, I don't recognise that sort of negative approach. I do recognise there are ser serious resource constraints, but I think up and down local authorities have been, especially in recent times, been incredibly innovative to engage with a much wider community and want to be seen to be doing that. We'll, we'll move on now. Uh, the event in Stirling I referred to oh, some two hours ago now, I did find myself saying I never thought I'd stand on a platform and say what we need in this country is more planners, but I did see it. <laughs> I've, now, I've now put it on public record. I may retract that at some point. Uh, oh, no, no. Graham Simpson. Uh, thanks very much. Um, so one of, one of the issues in, in the planning system is that pe people, uh, communities, however you want to define that, feel that planning is done to them and not with them and not 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 by them um and this has led to immense frustrations this is just a fact it's not an opinion immense frustrations with the system um, and particularly with the system of appeals now the bill currently makes no mention of that um but you know we've we've had a lot of comment on that so this is your opportunity to tell us what you think about the current appeal system and the, you know, if the bill stood, that would remain as it is. Um, do you think it's right as it is, i.e. only one side can appeal or should you have something, something new? Okay, um, so this is opening up the discussion, which I'm sure there's some strong opinion in relation to equal right of appeal. I suspect Claire Simmons, I saw your hand go up lightning speed when that was mentioned. <laughs> Well, let's face it, that's what we're here for. Um, as, I, as I mentioned in the, in the beginning, uh, it, it, ERA is, uh, or Equal Rights of Appeal, is presented as a, a blunt instrument um, and it is uh, seen as slowing things down and polarising uh, people and uh, creating a divisive system. Um, and, and so it was somewhat hastily dismissed. Um, but I do think it is possible that if we could look at it as a way of using it to design a system that encourages people to front load uh, and get engaged at the uh, beginning of the system because as Andy said earlier, we have been trying to do front-loading for 50 years, and we've got to think about how we do something differently. Also, um, making a plan-led system a re reality, um, we can use this mechanism um, in our highly discretionary planning system. And Andy has talked about um, the, the gap between the, the plan-led system and the plan plans that we produce and the decision making that happens at the end of the process and we want to bring together those two things and that we think will create public confidence in the planning system why else would you want to get engaged at the front of the system if the decision making at the end of the system um, goes against or could go against what you've worked hard to get at in the front of the system so we think we very much see equal rights of appeal as a means of improving front-loading engagement and getting people involved because they will it will incentivize better behavior we also think it will incentivize uh, developers to um, perhaps work harder to get people um, involved in in uh, public engagement as well because there is a, a stick at the end of the process they they might have to um, uh, you know, if, if, there's, if there's going to be an appeal process at the end, then they might make work harder to, A, get their uh, plans, uh, getting people involved in planning um, and, and the application right at the beginning, uh, but they'll also maybe work harder to uh, improve the, uh, make sure they put in a really good application at the beginning. So the evidence from Ireland is that 
equal rights of appeal do improve uh, the decision making and that's something that I think we've all been discussing um, in about uh, the purpose of planning and having a much more positive planning system and one that delivers good development and we think that uh, appeals should in, in a system that is the, the main outcome is getting good uh, decisions and good uh, development, then it shouldn't be afraid of having an appeal system where that is th that is the purpose of trying to achieve it, is to get people to be able to um, ensure that the development that they're getting is the best that they possibly can. And why why should there be a reaction to that sort of mechanism? Okay, thank you. Other views from the panel? Anyone else like to come on that? Uh, I suppose, um, yeah. well, P Petra... Gander your thoughts. Ian Cook caught my eye first. We'll take Ian Cook in first, and then we'll come to you next, Petra. Yeah, I, mean, I think, um, as, as the questioner says, that there is a perceived inequality in the, in the planning process, and there's a power dynamic which needs to be addressed by the planning bill. I think if we're looking, as we all are, for greater community involvement in the planning process, then the community need to have confidence that that intervention, that them getting involved in that, is actually going to make a difference, and that doesn't uh, I don't think it exists at the moment, and that, that ultimately this will lead to better placemaking. Um, we haven't got a sort of strong view. I, mean, I, I suppose we, 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 we do agree with the principle of equality, um, so feel that there should either be an equal right of appeal or that the current right of appeal for developers is removed. So we are looking for a, a level playing field which might help to address that power inequality that I mentioned. Thank you. Petra? Um, First of all, I want to say that uh, the, the review panel took, does not took a lot of time to listen to evidence from across different uh, groups, uh, organisation. We looked at the most recent debate that happened in, at, at that time in the Welsh Assembly. Uh, we looked at uh, incidents of, of third party right of appeal across, across um, Europe and beyond. And the reason we came down to, to say not to suggest a third party right of appeal was simply because we wanted to create a new planning system that was truly empowering individuals and community groups that truly fostered a dialogue between all the groups and all the interests. And let's face it, it's often seen as a Goliath versus David battle. It's not. We have developers, small scale house builders. We have developers who are individual housing units. We have developers who are putting up a shop. They are all developers, and we want to bring together a kind of, uh, I suppose, a kind of dialogue that really can um, imagine what we want for our place and what we want for, for the nation. And they often, very often, there are kind of views that we have to exercise and we have to tease out, and that can be best done in a dialogue rather than saying, oh, I don't want to be engaging in a local place plan because I know I have an exercise later on to exercise a right of appeal. I do agree that the appeals right seems to be overdue for reform because it was in 1947 for just a 10-year period to help smooth the, uh, the, the, the new Town and Country Planning Act at that time. So maybe there are opportunities, and, and I have discussed it with some of you, there might be opportunities to look at it again. However, I have three points to make. I would say that it exacerbates conflict. And I think it under, undermines the point of very early engagement, which is what we want to see between all factors. And I think also it would undermine a plan-led system. And bearing in mind that we're adding another layer of local place plan into the plan-led system. And I think it's also, it feels to me that it's, um, it's, it's, it's quite a, a challenge. I mean, Ireland is very different in terms of a planning system and in terms of its uh, uh, politics and it, how it is constructed. So I wouldn't want to look at Ireland and say we can do it in Scotland because in Ireland, the local uh, elected members has no role in the planning system. So we need to be looking very differently. At, at we, There's no like for like. I think for me, it's about, it's about bringing in the various people that we don't hear enough. And the fact is... Currently, and uh, the, um, um, Chris Oswald has written to this, uh, to this submission to say that currently they're finding it extremely challenging to find and allocate sites for gypsy travellers equally and because they're always uh, uh, objected to by the local community as bad development. Equally, 
community housing association and housing association in general find it very difficult to get the appropriate land in, in the right location, again, because it's viewed by uh, some groups in the community as bad development. So we need to try and square the circle here and have a society and a, a debate that actually the planning system facilitates a, a, a better debate. And from, for that reason, uh, I would say that uh, third-party right of appeal is not helpful in, the, in this current traction of the planning bill. Thank you for putting that on the record, Dr. McLeod. Um, well, Community Land Scotland has, has a position that really e echoes that with regard to uh, third party right of appeal. We, we um, are not in favour of its reintroduction for precisely those kind of reasons, broadly, in, in, in relation to what Peth has articulated. And, and we do see um, the importance of actually front loading the process so that we, we, we get that uh, working effectively to, to ensure that community voices are heard within that context. And, and, and Mr uh, Simpson, you mentioned um, just at the very start of, of, as, a, as a preface to your question around um, communities having things, their voices not being heard in, in, in part of that process and being a, a, as being a given. I think that's true and I think it's, it echoes, it actually echoes some, some research that Community Land Scotland has commissioned from uh, Inherit uh, which is a, a, a consultancy um, company based in, in Glasgow, uh, which has been doing some work for us on the place of people in landscapes, and particularly thinking about how uh, wild land designations um, interact or inter intersect with people's views of, of how they view landscapes themselves. And one of the kind of comments, were very tellingly, which comes through from that, uh, almost echoes your own, whereby we had a respondent uh, speaking to Inherit saying, we we've got people doing things to us rather than with us. And having that dynamic out of kilter is, is, is a pretty critical point, I think, in terms of uh, how, how we um, think about communities' voices within this, within this context. So getting that balance right thinking about how we can incorporate um, communities' views and, and wild land is one important but kind of uh, example of that process in terms of how, how the balance of that sits with regard to uh, communities themselves is, is, is a good example, I think, of, of, of how we need to change and shape the planning process and think about this bill with regard to uh, front-loading that so that, that these kind of tensions are ironed out and, and, and people's voices actually he are heard a little bit more loudly than they have been. OK, thank you. Dr Lynch? Yeah, I'd just like to obviously come back from a, a sort of a in favour of, of your position uh, or equal rights of appeal. Um, <clears throat> I think th the point about trying to get people engaged early in the process is, is the right one. And, and it's important to get that upfront engagement right. But at the moment, because of the very discretionary nature of the planning system in Scotland, you can do all you like to get that upfront engagement right, but the decision subsequently may well depart from what's been engaged in that process. And decisions about the use and development of land entail conflict. So it's, 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 a, it's a positive idea to get people together in, in agreement and to try and shape agreement about how the, the future of places should develop. But ultimately, you're going to be making hard decisions where some people are going to be winners and some people are going to be losers. And so it's not realistic to expect that you can dissolve that conflict uh, by, through, through front-loading mechanisms. And that's why you need to think about the end of the process also. If you want really effective... Uh, front-loading engagement, you have to offer people incentives to get involved. If I'm a community and you tell me to prepare a local place plan and we devote hundreds of hours of our evenings and weekends to produce a local place plan with very, very little uh, resource and input, we get that local place plan agreed and then six months, a year down the line, two years down the line, the local planning authority is making decisions which completely overturn all that work that we did. That does nothing for uh, public trust, it's hugely undermining of effort, it's hugely undermining of front-loading. And in those circumstances, which is a, a stark and clear example, that inequality becomes glaring and it's very problematic. It's problematic for the legitimacy of the planning system and it's problematic for uh, the future of front-loading and, and of positive engagement in planning. And that's why a, an equal right of appeal, which would involve restricting a developer's right of appeal and uh, uh, produce, introducing, as, as we would argue, a, a limited right of appeal for communities, could re really reinforce the plan-led system insofar as appeal rights would only apply where decisions were made that went contrary to the development plan. So Petra's point that people can just sit back and wait 
uh, they don't need to get involved in the plan because they'll get a second chance at the end of the system. That doesn't apply. If you don't get what you want in the, in the agreed into the local plan at the start, you won't have those appeal rights. So that provides a very, very powerful incentive for people to get involved in the production of their plans. It doesn't mean they can sit back and say, I'm just going to wait and have a fight at the end of the process. And that applies to developers and it applies to communities. And if we want to be serious about a plan-led system, that's a very powerful mechanism which is not being taken advantage of to really create that plan-led system. And I think that it's, it's kind of disappointing that that's been very hastily dismissed because these arguments uh, haven't really been looked at or debated in full. And, uh, you know, frankly, you know, the, the number of submissions that are mentioning this show that it's an issue which people care about and are concerned about. And I think that's partly because the inequality is very glaring and it's something that's very obvious to people. It's not a panacea. It's not going to resolve the problems of planning overnight. But it's potentially a very positive mechanism that doesn't have to be a blunt instrument, as Claire said. So... Any other comments from the, the panel before all the MS? Well, actually, Mr. Simpson back in to follow up than other MSPs have bid for supplementaries. Any other comments from the witnesses? I, I, don't, I have to say, like, I don't know where this phrase comes from, hastily dismissed, because it was not hastily dismissed. We had looked at it in, in a lot of detail over months and months, gathering evidence. I do think the spirit of this planning bill in front of you is, a, is one that wants collaboration and is one that wants early engagement at the earliest opportunity and safeguarding that safeguarding that is by bringing a duty to having local place plan rooted in the development plan. I think that's the importance, is to find the, the right kind of mechanism where you protect that. But at the same time, and it's absolutely true, planning has always got to compete different demands. What we feel with many communities that we work with, as long as you explain and as long as you let people understand and be transparent in the decision-making process, even if people don't get what they actually want, it's to treat people with respect and with, with, with the, giving them the information is much, much more powerful. I'll give you just a recent example. We've been working with a community down in Dumfries and they wanted to put forward certain amounts of uh, development, which wasn't actually happening. But at the same time, ex explaining why the process wasn't possible at this time round actually helped. So I don't agree with your view that a uh, third-party right of appeal will actually help the system here. OK, let, let's follow up with some of our MSPs. Now, Graham Simpson asked a question, so any supplementaries on, on that? Graham, want to follow up on some of that? Yeah, um, so I've got, I've got di different questions which I'll... I'll I'll, I'll put to yourselves uh, planning democracy and PAS because you've made different points um, and you come from a different perspective. So to uh, planning democracy, um, obviously one of, the, one of the arguments against introducing any, any kind of right of appeal uh, for, for communities or, or, or people is that it could slow down development, it could frighten developers away um, and already um, I certainly, I certainly hear the uh, developers say that, well, we don't want to do business in Scotland. The, you know, the landscape here is is worse than it is elsewhere. This would make it even worse. Um, so, what would be your answer to that? Because inevitably, it would slow down the system. Now, before you come back, um, I've got a question for sort of Paz as well. I'll let you back um, on that if you want. But just so you will get the opportunity. It's a different question. We could allow. Dr. Lynch or clear to answer that, and we'll definitely let you back in to follow that up. Okay. Yep. Yeah, no, I think um, that's based on a blunt instrument interpretation of how an equal right of appeal would work, I would suggest. My view is that if we want a plan led system, development which is designated in a plan should have a, a smooth process through. If, if development is coming forward which meets the agreed terms of a development plan, that won't be subject to appeal, that won't be slowed down, that will be enabled and facilitated, and that's proper and correct. If development comes forward, which is not in accordance with that development plan, I think it's right to say that in that circumstance, we might want to take a second look at that. We might want to have the capacity to take a second look at that. That's going to be a decision which is, is controversial. It's out with what was the parameters of what was agreed and expected. And in that situation, it's right and proper that we might take a, a bit of extra scrutiny. And yes, that may lead to, to a slower process for those developments. And what that does is creates an incentive to make sure that the development that comes forward is in accordance with the plan and strengthens the plan. So I think that, uh, and, and, and it also means that it's, it's much more marginal in terms of the developments which are slowed down are the ones which are coming forward which are out with the plan and where it seems fair enough to have a second look. We're not saying that those decisions should be necessarily uh, dismissed out of hand and refused. It might well be that the situation changes and that development should be approved, but it, it, it's not unreasonable to say that there's, there's, uh, there's a good reason for taking a second look. OK, 
Okay, Graham Simpson, you wanted to come back in? Are you once again? Yeah, I just, I just wanted to also um, suggest that any marginal decisions or, or potentially controversial decisions would also be subject to um, a, a, a right of challenge or appeal. And I think, again, that uh, it might produce some sort of delay in those sorts of processes. But I think it's important for democracy and for um, people to have confidence in the system that, a, uh, that for example, if a, a decision that is made by the um, council on its own land or its own application should be looked at um, and, that, and that only can provide confidence and yes it might perhaps delay for a few weeks but it, you know the, 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 the wider benefits is what we're trying to uh, ask people to look at it look, you know not, not just looking at the, the process elements uh, So Paz um, I have to say Petra um, yeah, your, your submission uh, where, you, where you say the provisions of the bill will promote stronger public involvement um, and your, your view that this appears to be the case. Um, I don't see that in the bill uh, at all. Um, I think um, we actually could end up with less public involvement. I think that's maybe what you want to be in the bill, but it actually isn't. Um, now, you said that you thought the system of appeals uh, was ripe for reform, but you didn't suggest any reform. Perhaps you can do that now. Two parts. First of all, I think the bill has got, I think we in the, in the review panel, I would say we were more ambitious. There was more in there. Certainly because of the local place plan and giving it proper teeth, I think that can really lead to this democratic, addressing the democratic deficit and actually leading to a more engaged public, which currently is not the case. Yes, we have the same groups that know around how the planning system works, engaged again and again and again, but the vast majority out there is not involved and we want to see that happening. In terms of the appeal right, well, I've, I've been looking at what's happening in most of uh, continental Europe where we don't have an appeal right and where the, on both sides. And I think this is maybe an opportunity to look at what's happening, what can we do in simplified planning zones, in areas of uh, where we are front-loading, where we have the developer, where we have everybody sitting around the table. There may be opportunities, maybe some further work is required on that. So are you suggesting, are you suggesting removing appeal rights uh, I'm just in, in I'm, simplified development zones. I'm just saying there may be opportunities to look at something fresh. Okay. Lots of bids of supplementaries from, from, from MSP, so just so they know that I've, they've caught my eye. And I'm only going to bring Kenneth Gibson in, but Andy Whiteman and Monica Lynn have also asked for supplementaries on this. Kenneth Gibson. Yes, that's uh, very much. A couple of uh, questions I would want to put to the panel. First one, um, with regard to the Ireland situation that was actually mentioned early on by Claire Simmons, um, uh, the Irish uh, situation means that in infrastructure projects and specific developments are actually excluded from third-party uh, right of appeal, which uh, shows them surely um, to... Uh, shows that um, there is clearly a need to protect some developments from uh, not being delayed such that it would impact on Ireland's competitiveness. If the third party right of appeal was introduced here in Scotland, what exemptions should there be from it, <laughs> if any? The reason to go, I suppose, to, to the main advocates of that from our witnesses, so Dr Inchor Claire Simmons. We have set out in our evidence that we think that there should be a limited right of appeal which would be that uh, would only apply in situations for, for both developers and communities uh, where uh, decisions would be made that were a departure from the plan. Uh, another limitation would be uh, situations where local authority um, had an interest in the land. Um, another is uh, where decisions were made against an officer's recommendation, purely because that seems to be an indicator that there's some controversy or something that might be worth having a, a second look at. Um, I think that the, there are examples of... Uh, of planning systems in, in Australian states also and stuff where uh, third party rights are suspended on certain kinds of priority projects and it might be that uh, national developments could be looked at in that way. I think that there's a much broader question there around how you enable engagement in big infrastructure projects and I think if you, that, that's a very big and separate issue uh, to, to uh, a right of appeal to some extent um, and I mean in Scotland we already have a 
a complex consent regime, so energy consents and other things go through different regimes and aren't uh, fed through the Planning Act. So there's a whole set of questions around how you would uh, align uh, those different regimes and, and how different types of infrastructure development might be subject to, uh, are subject to proper public scrutiny and engagement and input, uh, which includes national developments in, in the MPF. So it opens up a, a much broader uh, range of issues. I think that in general terms, uh, for the last 20 to 30 years, there's been this idea that planning is a source of delay has been something which has been repeated around the world, actually. It's been a very powerful uh, uh, argument for uh, reform of planning systems around the world. Uh, the evidence for it, if you look at big infrastructure projects and the lifetime, the life cycle of a big infrastructure project, the length of time spent in planning, and I'm uh, thinking here of a, a recently published paper uh, uh, last year by colleagues at Oxford, Brooks and Cardiff universities, which looked at big infrastructure planning in England, which shows that the planning process hasn't really changed over time, that those delays are often as likely to be caused by uh, uh, developer commitment uh, wavering uh, or by political commitment wavering. And if you look at the, the, the amount of time spent in planning and making that decision against the life cycle of a development, it's not very uh, great. And when you think about the impact of those developments environmentally, socially and economically, it's right that we, that we have a democratic process of scrutiny. And you've got to think about how you're going to include that and, and enable that process. So big kit infrastructure projects, I think, are a somewhat uh, separate issue or a debate worth having as a separate issue. Uh, but the, the same principles apply, that scrutiny is very important, and even more so, in fact, on those kind of developments. Any other witnesses want to come on that before Mr Gibson follows up? Mr Gibson? Yes, uh, we heard from Mr Cook, and I quote, the community needs to have confidence. And uh, we've just he we've heard about... Uh, uh, from all witnesses about the need for community engagement throughout uh, this morning's session. But what is interesting is uh, that, uh, I mean, uh, Mr Inch there was, was talking about um, councillors' um, views being overturned. Will they be overturned by elected representatives, I would have thought, who actually have a, have a, a direct link to communities? One of the things that you've put in your submission, uh, um, uh, Planned Democracy, uh, is you, you talk about the right of appeals for communities would create a powerful incentive for individuals, community groups and developers to get involved in the production of plans. But who actually are these communities? I mean, oh, the communities themselves, is it, is it the... How would you, a community be involved? Uh, my un, my experience in many cases, having been elected first in 1992, is that community engagement often extends to seven or eight people who turn up at a meeting and claim to represent the community, but they don't actually themselves actually liaise with other people in the community. They don't do newsletters, they might not have a website, they might not even have a collective email address, whereas elected representatives do actually have to stand or fall by um, th th their decisions. So how, how do we ensure that this, um, this uh, group, which everyone seems to talk about, this community, is actually representative of the people in an area? And if we're designing local plans, how do we exclude the issue of NIMBYism? We've heard about, you know, oh, if we put together a plan, and as long as the plans are tiered to, there wouldn't really be an issue with third-party right of appeal. But I've got communities in my constituency, I know everybody else does, who point blank don't want any development full stop. They don't want housing, they don't want wind turbines, they don't want uh, economic development. Often they're retired, they've got reasonable pensions, so the issue of economic growth sustainability is a matter for somebody else. How do we counter those issues and ensure that we actually do move forward? And just the last point I would say that is that in the, the session that myself and Alexander were at on Monday, two sessions, we had 19 organisations who represented a host of groups who were involved in development and none of them supported third right of appeal because they all felt it would put Scotland at a competitive economic disadvantage. Squeeze a lot in there, Mr. Gibson. Indeed, because I probably wouldn't have another shot. So. Yeah, that's, that's probably true, unfortunately, <laughs> because of time. Um, so who wants to... I, Petra. I think that th there's, there's a really important debate here, and that is about the uh, generational imbalance as well. A lot of people who are involved in the, pl in the current system, and I, I think... This is a challenge. We are talking about a current system, which all the fault, but we are also looking towards a new system. For, for me, very fundamentally, we need to bring in much, much more young people. I mean, at this moment in time, Scotland has signed up to the UN Charter of the Rights of the Child to be involved in decisions that affect them. Place affects young people, whatever age. It affects everybody, but young people 
disproportionately and not involved. And if we are talking about who needs the housing of the future, if we are talking about what kind of infrastructure do we need, we need to have all of the people involved in this debate. And I can't, I know, I mean, for me, it's not about being punitive. It's about being proactive, engaging, and actually listening to everybody's view. We have just recently completed another charrette uh, not far away from here, where we really got out and brought in the young people, we brought in people who don't normally have the time to get involved, we brought in people who are in care homes and wanted to have a discussion with young people. It's very, very important that that kind of debate is being had, because if we're really talking about a new kind of planning system that is inclusive and collaborative, and that actually also facilitates development of whatever size and kind, um, then I think we need to have everyone involved. And that's not naive. I see that happening on the continent, and it works well, and it speeds up. No, absolutely going to come to plan democracy in a second. I promise you, you'll have a substantive response. Dr McLeod, first of all, though. It's just a quick reflection on uh, Mr Gibson's uh, comments here in relation to, to who is the community. That's probably a three-day conference in itself. But um, <laughs> a, for, 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 you know, to kind of fly the flag, if you like, for, for community landowners, they do represent their communities because they are elected bodies that have constitutions and are accountable uh, through um, the, the members of that community in relation to who, who gets voted onto the trust or the board and they have to represent their community in that, in that context. So that's an accountability mechanism, it's a kind of transparency mechanism, a democratic mechanism that doesn't exist in some other types of land ownership in Scotland, certainly in private land ownership in some instances uh, and, and, and others too. So that's a really important critical point for community land ownership per se. The other point you made was around um, development and, and challenges to that. I think uh, Mr Simpson mentioned that as well in relation to uh, drags on development. Critical thing here, I, Community Land Scotland would suggest, is that, that when we're talking about development, we're talking about sustainable development. And that's about getting the balance right between the economic, social and environmental aspects of that. And the classic, and I, forgive me for going back to this, but I think it's important, that, that the one of the best, most effective examples of where these tensions exist and why it's challenging for, for communities um, in, in relation to getting that balance right is around concepts of wild land and wild land mapping. Uh, because in, in effect, uh, you have quite often a process where um, a, a designation or a kind of label is being given to a part of the landscape which is artificially constructed, which has basically uh, moved human uh, engagement out of it. And that has significant implications for uh, how, how people and communities actually engage with the landscape within that context. So when we're thinking about development opportunities, yes, they have to be sustainable, and yes, they have to reflect economic growth and environmental sustainability and kind of social cohesion, but the balance needs to be right in terms of that. And part of that process is about realigning, we would argue from Community Land Scotland's perspective, uh, and, and, if, and from the, to continue the wild land example, thinking about how we kind of rebalance that. And our call in our, sub, in our submission to actually introduce and, and have ministers having regard to a map of no longer existing human communities in terms of uh, where they are sits very nicely or very appropriately, we would argue at least, in terms of these debates and, and conflicts and challenges around sustainable development. So we'd certainly advocate that being on the face of the bill and certainly within policy as well. And you're right to take your opportunity to come back to to the area of wildland, because you may not get the opportunity elsewhere within within a kind of vastly speedily shrinking evidence session, uh, Dr. Inch. Yeah, sure. I think um, from a planning democracy perspective, uh, communities are often portrayed as NIMBYs. It's a very useful label because it dismisses them as having a fixed position and a fixed set of interests which are unchangeable and which are opposed to everything. Uh, and, and it creates uh, and it reflects an adversarial planning system. We do have a planning system that's adversarial, and it's adversarial because uh, of the discretion at the end of the process, largely, which means that speculative development applications come forward and are put forward, uh, and, and people react to that. Uh, and, but in, in our experience, people are far from uh, having hugely fixed NIMBY interests in people care about the future of the places where they live and they want a stake in the future of the places where they live. NIMBY is not a, a useful label in that regard. It's a way of dismissing people uh, and a way of dismissing uh, the, the responsibility of the planning process to engage in a process through which people explore uh, how development needs if, of various kinds can, can be met for the future, and that's the kind of the, the positive, proactive idea of planning, which has been talked about a lot today, needs to think seriously about how it can uh, achieve those kind of things. Um, so I, I think there's a real problem there, uh, which, which 
reflects kind of a planning system which has got uh, very entrenched uh, in, its, in its positions. Um, I think the, the other point that I would... Well, two points, actually. One, uh, an example of where that sort of uh, entrenched uh, divisive planning comes up a lot uh, in the work of planning democracy is around uh, repeat applications, uh, where developers can come back onto the same site with applications... Uh, an application is refused, but within a couple of years they're able to come back with the same application. So a community goes through a whole process of mobilising around something which is uh, oftentimes out with an agreed development plan. It's refused, and then it comes back again and again and again. And developers can can win a war of attrition if they're well resourced against communities. And in that situation, it's no wonder that people step back and become very opposed to an anti-development which they feel has been done to them instead of with them. Uh, and these are kind of examples of, 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 of why we have these kind of position, this sort of position taking in the planning system, which something needs to be done about. Um, the other point I come back on is the, the competitive disadvantage point, which I think has been bandied around a lot around uh, appeal rights. I think again, I would say that's a blunt instrument version of uh, of era argument. If you really think that Scotland's competitive com competi competitivity will be disadvantaged by having a second look at applications that are out with the terms of an agreed development plan, then Scotland's competitive rests on a on a very thin basis. Uh, and I, I don't really believe that that argument stacks up particularly strongly uh, when you think about uh, applying it in that kind of a restricted way. Okay. Uh, yes. Briefly Back on the councillor, so yeah. uh, you mentioned about councillors as well, and it's a, a discussion that I've had with uh, councillors, and I think it, uh, it was agreed uh, with the Edinburgh uh, councillors who, who asked for a, a right of appeal because they found that uh, the imbalance of one uh, party having the right of appeal and the others means that their, their decision-making was kind of being biased towards the person who had the right of appeal because they've got a right of appeal, so the, the council don't want to make those sorts of decisions um, uh, in case... Uh, this developer brings a, a, an appeal, and I think it. Uh, they wanted it because they wanted it to be able to. They wanted to be able to make stronger decisions and be empowered to make uh, a, a, a decision that, you know, could go contrary to what an applicant wants, but not have the threat of an appeal and and the cost that that brought uh, with it. Thank, thank you very much. A couple of questions further on this, Andy Whiteman. Uh, yes, thanks very much, uh, convener. Um, the Edinburgh example you've just mentioned, of course, is Edinburgh seeking to restrict the applicant's right of appeal because it wants to have the final say, in a sense, in what application takes place. And I noted that West Lothian Council, in their written submission, also say that they believe that uh, the right of appeal should be removed where a development proposal was significantly contrary to an up-to-date development plan. Um, and it restates that position which it made earlier. I'm just wondering, you know, we, we have a number of instances, and I think members have all had correspondence uh, about these in recent weeks as well, um, where we have land that is in a local development plan as zoned uh, as, as, as use A. For example, an application comes forward for it to be used for use B. That is rejected because it's not in accordance with the plan. Um, the applicant appeals, it goes to the, uh, 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 the DPEA, they uphold that appeal, and then ministers come in and overturn it. So can I suggest that the ambition, and Petra talked about undermining plan-led systems, the ambition to have a plan-led system, to have upfront engagement, is that undermined by the ability of applicants, not third parties, but applicants, to appeal decisions that have been well-made, well-formed, and form the basis of a local uh, development plan. And in that sense, could some of the tension and some of the um, uh, cynicism of the system be uh, removed if we substantially remove the applicant's right of appeal, which, as Petra said, initially was only meant to last 10 years? I would love all of you to answer briefly would be great very, but all very, of you to very, answer very briefly I think we are, we are we're on a journey just now and uh, often what's been said is that the current system doesn't work as well as it should and could have done but we are in a new kind of era we are seeing a new kind of bill being proposed with very very different mechanism and we want to strengthen them I think we can this is now an opportunity to make it even stronger to have the local place plan even stronger and yes to look at the current appeal system in its entirety and I think that's quite important and I'm sure from a uh, from an alliance point of view, we will be making further comments on that. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? If they could, you can ask a question, not make a comment on, on someone else's question, just let witnesses... I just wanted to 
just to the both the the, the West uh, West Lothian and also to Edinburgh, because I think this is a, actually a journey that we're seeing now in terms of local authority exerting a little bit more uh, power. Sorry. Okay, if you just if it chimes with you, what the question was, you might want to put that on the record, and our deputy Vera would like to come in and explore some other matters, Ian Cook. Just to go back to the point I made earlier about sort of trying to address perceived inequality in the system, that um, for us it is about the principle of equality and, and making that kind of quite obvious and transparent. So how it's done, I, I think, is probably less important than actually addressing it. And Dr Inch, Claire Simmons, don't want to put words in your mouth, but I'm not, not a great leap of faith to see you probably agree with the comments that Andy Whiteman has said. Do you want to put anything else on the record before we go to our deputy uh, convener? Our suggestion would be to restrict... Uh, both to restrict the existing right of appeal and to expand the right of appeal for uh, community. One thing is that I think planning democracy do feel is that there is a purpose to an appeal system in terms of testing, scrutinising and potentially improving decisions. And to lose that entirely potentially is not a good thing. OK, thank you. Um, Monica Lennon. Thank you. Well, we've covered an awful lot there. So I think we started to touch on um, a rights-based approach and Petra was talking about young people. Um, I know we might take evidence from Cliff Haig at a future session that will go into that but we're still even today talking about the community as a third party so I wonder if that in itself is a bit of a of a barrier. Petra if we can go back to the review I mean you've talked about the alliance past you're on the review you're on the local moments national park authority so you're, you're wearing lots of hats but when you were back when you were on the review and you were doing that scan of looking at European um, practice and so on. What what hat were you wearing? Was that a pass hat? Yes. Right. So in terms of the sort of 800 live cases that you have, I, I take it that's like an annual average. You've got a thousand inquiries. The people that pick up the phone and, well, I still think of you as planning aids, but as past the people who call on you for advice and support, what are their views? What sort of consultation have you carried out with them? And you know, who are, who are your stakeholders? So, I don't think they're necessarily stakeholders. I think there are people that have come to know about the planning system often very late in the day. They may have come across a planning application from the neighbour or they have come across a um, development that they don't want to see. It's very often a very reactive, i.e. I don't want to have this happening. Can you talk me through? So sometimes uh, the advisor will then assist them in terms of understanding how the system works, understanding perhaps it's actually too late because it wasn't a local development plan. So there's lots of different, different ar arenas. I should say that um, in many cases, it is just actually understanding that for the first time they have a, there is a system, such a planning system. And it, I find it really, really hardening that there is so few people that know about it and that we're still having to field these kind of calls because people are not involved early enough. And that's why I think redressing the balance to bring people into the debate is so much, so crucial, so that we have a true, a true place plan that works for everybody. Earlier on, you, you said that the, the review panel didn't make a recommendation on you know, putting the, the purpose of planning into statute and perhaps that's an omission because you're now in your past submission saying that there should be a statutory definition of, of planning. You're now saying um, that we need to have a debate and, and look at appeals. Um, you know, rather than just have a debate, do we not need to get this right in terms of the bill? And you're, the three tests that you'd set down about um, you know, an equal right of appeal or equalising appeal rights could exacerbate conflict, it could undermine early engagement and it could undermine the plan-led system. Other witnesses have talked about the journey of a planning um, process, whether it's on a development plan or on a, 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 an actual um, application. For those of us today who've talked about how we um, get to a point where the integrity of the, of the development plan is, is really taken seriously, um, are we really saying that um, allowing applicants then to come in at the end of that process and just lodge an appeal anyway if they don't get the decision that they like? What, what does that actually do to strengthen the plan-led system? Surely if people are not in favour of introducing um, equal rights of appeal um, for people who live in an area <laughs> and have to live with the consequences of a decision for many, many years, should we not be looking at curtailing the the, the 
appeal rights open to applicants? I, I, I firmly believe that what we should be doing is opening up the process so that everyone comes into the discussion about where do we put our 20,000, 50,000 affordable homes, in what location do we have them, bringing in the elected members, bringing in the various community groups, bringing in the developer to having an, a discussion that is adult and that is democratic. That's what we need right from the start. In terms of uh, the recommendations, the planning, the panel was, was asked by the then Cabinet Secretary, a particular remit, to look at uh, review, renewing the, the planning system, reviewing the planning system, and also look at innovation around housing. So these were the areas that we looked at. In terms of community engagement, I think there are so many different communities out there. They have very different views. Bringing them all together is actually really, really important now. And I think that's where we are right now, and that's where you have the opportunity to create a planning system that is really fit for the next 20, 30 years, whatever, however long it takes. Can I just come to planning democracy on that? Because what, what you've put forward in your submission isn't just an open-ended right of appeal. It's I think it's attempting to be proportionate and setting down um, criteria. Now, I think what Petra's saying is when the former Cabinet Secretary commissioned a review, the remit wasn't to look at the whole scope of planning. It was very much about delivering about housing. Um, is that a bit of a, a missed opportunity? Or is it... Do we still have time to get this right? I'd like to think there's still t time to get it right. We have a draft bill which needs to be worked up. I think there's a, a, a lot of concerns about the content of the draft bill. Uh, I'm, I, I mean, we, we've said we don't think that this, this debate has been particularly well had, and that, uh, particularly well held, particularly around equal rights of appeal. The government was very quick following the, uh, the panel's uh, uh, report to, to launch its ten, 10 commitments in response to the panel's report, one of which was a commitment not to, sort of negative commitment not to, to pick up Era. And that, that was effectively an attempt to, to close down uh, debate. And, and as we said, we feel that's been driven largely by the concerns of the development industry and others that are, that are, are based on this um, uh, sort of blunt instrument interpretation of what an equal right of appeal is. And we think that it's very important to, to have... Uh, Pet Petra's aspirations are, sound fantastic about getting people involved early, getting agreement, all that front-loading stuff. That really matters. My concern is where are the mechanisms that are going to make this happen? People have been saying that since 1969, the Skeffington Report. That's 50 years of good intentions which haven't yet materialised. So what is there here which is going to substantially change and challenge that and which recognises the nature of the planning system that we have, which is the, the nature of the discretion, the gap between the plan and the decision, and what that means for the ways in which decision-making operates. And I don't see that sort of analysis anywhere in the, in the discussion. I think that's a, a, a serious flaw in the kind of analysis and understanding uh, which, is, which is underpinning um, the bill. Just a, a final point. I mean, my understanding is planning democracy, you're completely volunteer led, you don't really get any public funding. Um, it struck me looking at some of the submissions that um, engagement, community engagement, um, it's not always a, a bottom up grassroots thing. There's, there's a lot of people who work in PR, who work in other organisations who come in and do community engagement. And I picked out one submission. It was from the Burnham to Ballinlug, I don't know if I pronounced that right, the A9 community group. And, um, and Petra, they talked about PASS, who had been brought in to act for Transport Scotland. But they talked about PASS outsourcing um, the design and distribution of communication, social media, was led by an agency in Edinburgh. So there seems to be an awful lot of people who have a stake in perhaps the status quo, which is about, you know, doing community engagement to communities, which maybe picks up on Graeme's point about people feeling that planning's done to them. So, again, is there is there a, a view that these processes, uh, particularly on... Um, pan and people come in and, and do this at a Saturday morning, here's a chance to come in and um, inform the, the process. Do people feel that is a big tick box so and I, they don't so really don't, have... I, so I think what I might do is I might give, because we're going to give Petra the opportunity sure. to, to okay. respond to that. Give, yeah. give me a second, Petra, because it's yep. a specific uh, consultation response we've had. Yeah. It's specifically about the role of pass and I think it's only appropriate to give uh, Petra maybe the opportunity to, to respond to that. There are a couple of questions we really need to ask for completeness in this bill. Members are itching probably to close the session for a comfort break. So once Petra responds, I'm going to do a couple of mop-up questions briefly and we're going to have to close this particular session, I'm afraid. Petra? First of all, 
Well, I want to uh, respond in writing to the committee on these particular allegations because they're very serious, because they're misleading, and they also have no facts. And I will write to, if the community allows me to write to them and, and share with you the letter that we have written to the community. I was no, reading no, out from no, the no, written I'm submission. Not saying you are, but it, yeah. the letter, yeah, this yeah, submission so, is factually so, so incorrect. So please, please write to us on yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, what in, has been entered into our public record that yeah. that has been said by an individual submission. That doesn't Absolutely. make it true. It just means they've said that it would be very, very helpful if you could correspond yeah. with us in relation to that. And the other point you mentioned about uh, the, the, how we make how we strengthen the system, I think now is an opportunity to make sure that the local place plan as a democratic expression I have real T's and I have given the, the right kind of um, uh, endorsement in the local development plan. Petra, you're still up here because one question we did want to ask to Planning in Scotland, uh, which I think is passed, which is only, only fair to ask, is it's been said that there could be a, a benefit in creating a statutory duty to involve young people in the planning system, uh, to, uh, and that could achieve a lot. How could local authorities prove that they've met requirements to to take forward this duty? Is that something past or particularly passionate about? You've put it in your submission opportunity to make some brief remarks in relation to that. I'm going to come to Dr McLeod in a second about one of what one of your your suggestions as well, Petra. I do think there's a there's a there's a deficit between um, the people that are currently involved in the planning system and the very many young people that are not engaged. And we are seeing an opportunity, especially if we talked about community councils, aging community councils needing that that sort of renewal. We're currently working in a in a school in, in the borders over a four-year period to bring young people into the planning system, understand the place agenda, work with community councils and development trust. It's a very new way of doing things called bridging the gap. I think, I think it's vital that young people and their voices are heard because A, they live longest with the decision that we are making as adults, and B, we have, I think, neglected to some extent to look at that sort of longer-term plan that young people need. So the duty was there because already you have signed up, or Scotland has signed up, to the convention of the of the um, the UN Convention of the Article of the Rights of the Child. So it's in there, and if we can find some mechanism, I think that will also change the debate. Because let's be honest, young people have a great fun capacity to think out the box. Okay, thank you for putting that on the record. And Dr McLeod, a, a lot of the debate has maybe squeezed out some of the comments I feel maybe you were hoping to make here today. And we were going to ask a little bit about Community Land Scotland's view uh, about your proposals aimed at encouraging resettlement of parts of rural Scotland and explain why you think this would be a desirable objective for the, the planning system. I think you've, you, you've, you've, you've very impressively managed to squeeze some of that in along the two plus hours, but this is your opportunity to put a little bit on the record before we suspend uh, in relation to this session. Dr McLeod. Thank you very much, convener, for that opportunity to, to do so. Um, we have touched upon some of this already, but I think it's, it's, it's well worth reiterating that we, we in Community Land Scotland see that there's a, a kind of pressing uh, and compelling case to think about um, alongside some of the issues that are being covered in, in the bill already, to think about issues of resettlement and repopulation of parts of, of rural Scotland that had previously been populated and, 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 and had been settled. And part of that is very much driven by ideas of the kind of social cohesion of rural Scotland itself and ideas of sustainable development within that context. So um, it's really about um, get, getting that balance with regard to addressing uh, some challenges that exist in, in existing communities, but also thinking about how we can uh, restructure that around um, where communities might aspire to exist and to be, and how that might benefit them in terms of uh, their quality of life, in terms of how they relate to the environment, in terms of their economic development opportunities. So we see this idea of, of, of repopulation and resettlement as, as and, and the duty that we're calling for, for Scottish ministers to... Um, uh, take account of that, the, the desirability of that as, as, as a relatively modest but important uh, development with regard to thinking about, to get back to the earlier question, what the planning process is for and how rural Scotland actually thrives ultimately as well. So we, we very much advocate that and would like to see, uh, certainly if the committee thinks so, some uh, consideration of that in, in your report, if you think it's fit to do so, we, we would ad advocate that. Um, but also within on the face of this bill and also in the, in the wider kind of policy framework. We've also called upon uh, for a particular um, stand alongside powers, if I can put that 
uh, terribly and eloquently, um, in relation to uh, how, how to actually do that. So around uh, uh, the Scottish Government and other authorities having regard for uh, resettlement and repopulation and the powers that might entail in terms of potential compulsory purchase powers and, and other aspects of that. Uh, and we've also as well, very importantly, from our perspective and our members' perspective, called for um, the a production by uh, Scottish ministers of a map of no longer existing communities. Uh, and that's important in terms of some of the issues we've alluded to already with regard to the relationship between people and landscape and where wild land and people's ideas of sustainability sit within that. And we see that as an important complementary mechanism in terms of helping to shape decisions around planning and sustainability in a rural context. OK, thank you. Now, Claire Simmons, hold on to that thought, because the session's about to get even longer still. I'd like to just note that it's now been a two-hour, 45-minute session, I think we've had, but we're trying, we're trying to maximise the opportunity to put things on the record. Mr Whiteman's indicated there's a, a, a specific question that will give you the opportunity to answer. I'm going to let Andy ask that question, but this will be a last opportunity, I'm afraid, to come back, and brevity will be... Uh, expected and anticipated, unfortunately, in relation to that, including the asking of the question, as important as it actually is, Mr Whiteman. Thank you, Convener. I just want to ask about the National Planning Framework and the Strategic Development Plan. So there's big proposals to change the status of the National Planning Framework, that it becomes a statutory part of the development plan. Um, I'm wondering about your views on that. Uh, it was introduced as a, a light-touch spatial expression of Minister's um, uh, policies. Um, and it doesn't have much scrutiny um, in this place. And the second is on the strategic development plans. They're proposed to be uh, abolished, um, and yet the Scottish Government's review in 2014 um, said that the system wasn't broken nor its potential yet fully optimised, and we've had evidence from Clyde Plan, for example, who've been working on this for 40 or 50 years, very much supporting the idea of strategic development plans. So any thoughts on the national and the strategic? If you don't have many thoughts, don't feel obliged to say it. As the convener says, we're tight for time. And also, if you've got many thoughts and you want to give us a flavour of those thoughts and write to us afterwards with more substantial views, please do that as well. So let's start with planning democracy. I, either Dr Inch or Claire Simmons, please. Well, I had a point to make about an inequality of arms, but... Uh, um, yes, well, I think we've already said about uh, national planning framework and we, uh, that we think it should be a national level document and not incorporated into the local development plan. I think that's all we would want to say that, uh, about that. We feel that the strategic plans have uh, not really had time to bed in and to, to lose them at this stage might be uh, a bit premature. Um, regarding the inequality of arms, I would just like to say that the uh, developers can put in repeat applications. They have the uh, luxury of time and money and resources and understanding of planning system that communities don't have. Um, and they can appeal. And uh, there is, when I started campaigning for recall right of appeal, I was quite surprised at how uh, the, the kind of reaction that I was getting against it. Um, and over time, I've come to realise that it's because there are another form of people. We talk about NIMBYs quite a lot, but I'd just like to put on the record that I think that there is a, uh, another form of people called DIMVYs. Uh, development is in my uh, vested interest, and uh, we have to be aware that those are the two people, uh, you know, that, that's what we're playing with. So. Developers will come in to defend themselves, I'm sure, and give their comments on equal right of appeal of what they believe the impact will be, but thank you. You should have taken your opportunity, and you did, to put that on the record. Dr McLeod. Uh, I think from Commute Land Scotland's perspective, the key issue is to make sure that the, that the, the national planning framework and uh, the, the levels of, of policy and governance below that actually fit together and, and work for communities and, and the, the sustainable development of Scotland. So we're calling, as we've said, without rehashing it, uh, to, to broaden out the vision thing for planning and how that fits and our proposals as documented and you've read, uh, hopefully propel that forward. Okay, thank you. Ian Cook? Thanks for that, Tad, on this question. My absolute favourite witness right now. <laughs> thank you, Mr Cook. Uh, Petra? The removal of strategic development plans, I think we felt there was the... We made that recommendation. It's to allow greater focus on uh, local plan making. It allowing authorities, especially now with city regions, to work together much more nimbly, because we felt in the past there was a lot of uh, delay partly because um, the lack of working together cohesively 
And I think also, again, uh, coming in line with the new bill, focus rather less focus on yet another big document, <coughs> but actually on spatial strategies and uh, on delivery. Delivery is one of the things that got lost in uh, the maraise of plan making in Scotland. We've had so many plans. In terms of the MBF, I think the national planning framework is absolutely vital. We also have argued that it should be discussed at parliamentary level because it is an expression of interest of what the society in Scotland needs and wants. And I think a great alignment with housing would be very, very important. And the infrastructure should be discussed at that level and hopefully on a regular basis. And I think cascading it down, the local development plan should be then a local expression of those needs which brings into the local place plan. So having a system that neatly fits up and down and everybody knows uh, what is expected of the, the different parts. This morning, everyone, everyone has a fair crack at the whip. I'm putting on record over nearly three hours now uh, evidence. So I'm going to start off actually with a thank you, and that's a thank you to the witnesses that have been waiting incredibly patiently for the next evidence session. And before I finally thank you and suspend, just some housekeeping. When we do suspend, we'll suspend to 12.05, and we'll run that, we'll run that next session to 12.45, and that will be the committee of business finished for the day. So can I just thank everyone for giving evidence this morning. Uh, we'll move to our next panel at 12.05, and we'll briefly suspend. Thank you.
Okay, welcome back everyone. And we move to our, we're still on agenda item one, but we move to panel two. And can I first of all, before I do the welcome, uh, can I put an apologies on behalf of Fiona Ellis, Business Support Manager, DF Concerts and Events, Mike Grieve, owner of the sub club and board member, Nighttime Industries Association and Mick Cook, composer. They have been, they've fallen by the, what is now a red weather warning, I, I understand, across both east and through central Scotland towards Glasgow. Um, so they send their apologies, but we are delighted uh, to have with us today Beverly Whitrick, Strategic Director, Music Venue Trust, and Tom Keel, Director of Government and Public Affairs, UK Music, who actually came from further afield, I understand, to attend today, but the planes <laughs> were running of other things weren't. Uh, also, thank you very much for your patience. That was a substantial and lengthy initial session, but it unfortunately just had to be, given the range of things we were discussing. Much more focused in this session and I think it's only reasonable to allow either or both of you to to make some opening remarks. Mr Keel. Okay, thank you very much and uh, thank you very much for giving us the, the privilege to, to talk to you today about this very important issue um, relating to, to the music industry. Um, I'm Tom Keel, I'm the Director of Government and Public Affairs for UK Music. Um, we're the umbrella body for the commercial music industry across the, across the UK. Um, we're quite a globally unique organisation in, in that we bring together the, the live music industry, the recorded music industry, the creators, the pu music publishers and the uh, collecting societies. Um, so I don't think there's many other organisations in the world who actually are able to bring all those kind of effectively disparate bodies and actually bring them together under, under kind of one, one, one footing. Um, the value of the music, we do a lot of work on data and research into the, the, to the music industry. We value um, our, the music industry's economic contribution as something like 4.1 billion to the economy. Uh, and in terms of generating exports, that's 2.5 uh, billion. And we employ 140,000. Those are UK wide figures. But we do also report on Scottish-specific figures. Um, Scotland has an immense contribution to the music industry. Um, just last, last year, we reported that Scotland uh, music tourists coming to Scotland uh, uh, spent in a region of 333, uh, £334 million uh, uh, pounds to the uh, Scottish economy. That's £212 million to concerts and £123 million to festivals. Um, 1.2 million people came to Scotland to go to live music concerts and events, and music tourism sustains 4,000 jobs in Scotland. Um, as an industry body, we're, we're um, always looking at areas where the industry can be strengthened. Um, one area of particular focus for us as an organisation that has taken place in the last um, 10 years has um, the concerns around venue closures, particularly in the small uh, small end and the grassroots level. Um, we calculate and uh, working with partners such as the Music Venues Trust, we estimate around 35% of venues closed in uh, the UK during that last 10 uh, ten year period, so effectively uh, we're a third down. Um, that is a matter of, of great concern. There are many reasons as to why venues may, may close. Um, uh, it could be licensing, could be business rates, could be just changes to business. But I think one of the main things that we've we've noticed um, over the over the years and the trend is actually planning issues becoming a particular concern um, and new developments, whether it's through the rise of gentrification in, in, in certain areas um, and new developments taking place and, and the costs that are associated with that, um, planning disputes can threaten a venue's existence. We have campaigned uh, for something called the Agent of Change Principle, which derives from Australian uh, uh, Australian law uh, originally. I think they had some success in achieving that initially, um, but we've campaigned for that um, in recent years. Effectively, that puts an onus on those coming into an area, those new businesses which are coming into an area, to actually take responsibility for the impact that they, they are making. It kind of puts an onus on the right to first occupancy, I think it's, it's sometimes termed as. Um, but it's, um, it's, a, it's, it's a very uh, strong, robust um, position that, that we hope to get to. We've made some substantial progress in England and Wales, and we're delighted by the, the announcement uh, last, uh, I think it was about eight, ten days ago or so now, um, in terms of the Scottish Government, what it's committed to in terms of um, changing um, uh, the planning um, framework, Scottish planning uh, framework and the uh, policy documents. Um, with that said, I think there are areas where we can make, it maybe can go further, where the agent of change and, and the planning law can be strengthened in even even greater detail, which perhaps we can come on to. But um, I think that's that's my initial opening remarks, which I hope is helpful to the, the committee. 
Beverly, do you want to add anything to that before we move to questions? Um, absolutely. Um, in contrast to UK Music, Music Venue Trust is a small and extremely focused organisation. We are a charity whose aim is to work specifically with what we term grassroots music venues. And by that, we mean the venues whose core purpose is to put on live music to with the intention of developing new artists and connecting them with audiences. So we're not talking about places that have music as an add-on to the other business models of selling alcohol or food or other things. We're talking about those venues whose reason for being is they believe in music and they want to share that music and develop new artists. So we see grassroots music venues as the research and development department of the UK music industry. And as such, we believe that they're sustained um, operation is incredibly important to the whole music industry but also to their social, cultural and economic value which I'm delighted to see has already been registered by, in the letter from the planning minister and the fact that Scottish Government absolutely recognises that. Um, a lot of the work we do is in partnership with organisations such as UK Music and the Musicians Union and one of the main things I'd like to do is just draw attention to the UK Live Music Census which has just been published. It's actually a UK wide report led by the University of Edinburgh and it's collected statistical evidence to support a lot of the anecdotal evidence that Music Venue Trust has worked with in the past and two of the key statistics are that one third of venue survey respondents in their online survey identified um, planning and property development had a negative impact on them in the last 12 months and nearly a third, i.e. 29% of venue respondents said that noise related complaints had had a negative impact in the last 12 months. So that goes together with the extent of the closures that Tom's already mentioned to emphasise how very serious the threats are to the sector and the need for action now in order to sustain this important role. Okay. Thank you to both of you for, for those remarks. We'll open up with some questions initially from Graham Simpson, MSP. Yeah, thanks, thanks very much. Um, uh, I, must, I must be honest, uh, before we had the sort of deluge of uh, correspondence on this issue, I wasn't wasn't really aware aware it was an issue, uh, but but it clearly is. Um, so I just wonder, for, first of all, if you could just uh, explain very 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 briefly um, what what the issue is is for you, you know what the problem is, and then we'll go on to discuss the the bill, which is actually what we're here to do. Okay, one of the the key issues, one of the, the biggest challenge for the grassroots music venues is that. They have historically operated in isolation. We were formed in 2014 and started to build a collective voice for the venues. And prior to that, venues had very much operated in their local community, but with little reference to each other or to larger venues or other parts of the music industry. The other factor that has helped create this stack of challenges is that in many instances, grassroots music venues are not recognized formally as cultural venues many local authorities perceive them to be businesses. A lot of them focus on the fact that they are licensed premises over their cultural contribution. And therefore, a lot of the time, the way they are approached and uh, worked with is as if they were a bar or a nightclub rather than a cultural venue. And what that's meant is that they face harsher licensing regimes, higher business rates, perhaps more scrutiny from the local police than other cultural venues. So one of the core pieces of Music Venue Trust mission is to try and gain recognition so that there's cultural parity between grassroots music venues, theatres, art centres, galleries, other spaces recognised as contributing to the cultural life of the UK. I just add to that, I think, as well, in terms of the particular problem that the agent of change is trying to trying to address. I mean, you've got a situation where a venue might have existed for for ten, fifteen years, um, quite existing, quite co coexisting with other other businesses in that that area. You then have a situation of a new build development or a, a change of use situation happening, and what happens is then that that creates problems for that venue because as soon as you develop residential accommodation, and we all want 
um, pe places for people to live. As soon as you actually develop that, then then you have a potential situation of leaving them vulnerable to um, to noise complaints issues, which then can threaten licences. And I think that's in many ways the crux of the the, the issue with with the where we're, we're calling for agent of change, because actually essentially it means that responsibility is then given to the developers or or whoever is actually the person making the change to actually help with things like soundproofing, putting noise limiters in. And those those types of issues. I think that's that's the crux. And I think that's as I said, because there's been a lot of developments in in recent years. I think that's um, where it's becoming increasing a problem. That's where some of the trends come in. Thanks. Um, uh, that was certainly my understanding. I think Beverly, you, you raise an interesting point, but it seems to be more licensing uh, based. And we're looking at planning today. So you've had you've seen the letter from the uh, the, the, the planning minister um, who said that he would tackle this through the national planning framework, which I presume you're happy with. Um, but in terms of the bill which we're scrutinising, is, is there anything that you think should go into the, into the bill you know, over and above the national planning framework? On the, um, on the particular the letter and the, the recent commitments from the Scottish Government, they are very welcome. I think you have to read them in... in, in, in combination with obviously the intentions behind the bill which is actually bringing the Scottish planning planning uh, policy within the framework itself that in itself strengthens that considerably and I think if you have a new, a, a new version of, of that document where there's explicit commitment towards agent of change I think that would be um, really important I think you're right to ask the question about where other areas where it where policy could go within planning and how that could help and improve the situation for, for music venues some of the areas which we're, we're thinking about is about whether you could actually um, require developers themselves to complete New, a noise impact assessment that's something that we maybe have looked at too that would kind of sit quite nicely alongside um, a, a, a the agent of change commitments that have already been introduced another uh, suggestion which has actually been developed in in wales um, concerning the um, uh, womanby street um, development in, in cardiff um, when they committed to agent of change they also committed to look at something called commercial enterprise zones or or local development plans and that's effectively looking at areas of cultural significance and actually trying to protect them um, and kind of create a, a framework um, that they can uh, have protections, particularly long-standing cultural, cultural areas. Um, I think that's, that's two areas in particular where we, where we think things, the, the bill itself could be, could be further strengthened too. I think additionally we could actually have a, a duty on planning authorities themselves to actually prevent unreasonable consequences. Essentially that, that, that is a for, would be a form of agent of change and maybe take things slightly, slightly further um, along, but it would maybe put it on an, an even greater statutory basis than the recent, um, recent commitments um, give um, effectively create. Okay. If, if I may add something to that, the cultural issue that I raised, yes, it, it does go into culture and it does go into licensing. However, there is a statutory right for the Theatres Trust to comment on any planning application in any part of the UK that impacts on an existing theatre building. We have no such right at the moment to comment on any planning application that potentially impacts on a grassroots music venue. Now, if Scottish Government were minded to consider that as a step forward it would be a trailblazing measure that doesn't happen anywhere in the rest of the uk but it would be a very definite planning measure that could be taken that would have a real positive effect on the protection of grassroots music venues how do you define what a grassroots music venue is we do have quite a robust definition that's now internationally accepted. It's something that talks about not only the intent of the business, but also the physical infrastructure of what they have. Um, and as I say, it's, it's about a place that exists to promote artists and has the correct infrastructure to do that, rather than being a pub that puts music on to attract other people to come. So there is a checklist, there is actually a definition that could be applied to assess whether a place that is being affected actually is a grassroots music venue. So, for example, in, in King Tut's in Glasgow, which has been subject to three planning applications in the last five months that have an impact on them, King Tut's is a world-renowned music venue that develops up-and-coming artists and, sh and enables audiences to connect with them. So the definition, yeah, I get, I get King Tut's. Um, I have actually been there. It was a long time ago, of course. Um, 
Um, so that is. Uh, I think we want evidence of that, but we'll yeah. let it go just now. Yeah. But yet no, we, it was, uh, no, 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 it was, it was actually to a gig um, convener. Um, but clearly, clearly a music venue first um, with a license. So I, I, I understand that. Yes. Thank you. Goodbye, members. In a second, can I just tease out? I know it, you can't speak about maybe live planning applications of what have you, but could you just give us an idea about the type of? Because I'm just trying to sense a little bit what we mean about their King Tut subject to three planning applications. What does that mean for that 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 venue? Because I'm unclear what it actually means. Uh, what it what it means for the venue is that we have within our network tried to promote a model where if venues become aware of planning around them they immediately try to find out more information about that and notify what's called our emergency response service so that we can assess whether if those developments go ahead it is likely to lead to noise complaints in the future and in the in the instance of King Tut's, very like similar things on Wyomanby Street in Cardiff. The developments are largely residential. I believe there was a hotel as well. Um, and the concern when there are proposals to develop residential accommodation or accommodation where people will be living or staying overnight is that in an area previously where the other activity was daytime and the venue was one of the only things happening at night, you're now faced at trying to find the balance between differing needs in a nighttime economy. And across the whole of the UK, we've seen many instances of music venues that thrived in a particular area of town because it was mostly offices and people left at 5.30. And then as residential accommodation is created in those areas, the nature of the area changes and you, you get a conflict between the people that like the vibrancy of the area, but want it to be quiet in their home. And obviously, we all understand that because people have a right to good quality housing. But if you move to an area that had a nighttime economy, which goes back to the zoning issue Tom mentioned, we believe that some sort of balance needs to be sought between enabling there to be a continued nighttime economy and cultural activity and well-built good housing. Okay, thank you. That, that's helpful. A number of members wanting in in relation to this. Perhaps they'll all confirm or otherwise whether they've been to King Tut's <laughs> or not. I can confirm that I remember getting in on several occasions, but I don't always remember leaving, so <laughs> I can't confirm either way. Uh, Jenny Gorouf. I too have visited King Tut's at one point. Uh, I do remember leaving, yes. I think I was asked for ID at the time, so that's how long ago it was. Um, I'd like to kind of drill down a wee bit on Graham Simpson's point, um, Beverly Whitrick, because he spoke about, um, you know, the cultural significance argument that you make in terms of grass music, uh, grassroots music venues. You talked about that designation in practice, and, and in response to Graham's question, you spoke, you linked it to the theatres, which have a statutory um, right to comment on planning applications because they are designated as a. Uh, as areas of cultural significance. Are there any other benefits you think might stem from having the same rule applied to grassroots music venues? And um, is there any other protection you think or action the government needs to take to protect and to promote grassroots music venues? That, that's a huge question. <laughs> um, at the heart of our work is this seeking for recognition of the cultural, social and economic um, status of the grassroots music venues rather than seeing them as profit-making businesses. And yes, we, we do think that it could bring many benefits over time. I mean, obviously, this moves into areas beyond planning as well, but it but it, it's just to do with the whole way they're perceived and therefore protected. There are very few instances of people moving near to a theatre and <coughs> complaining about the noise. There is one. Somebody has just moved in behind a West End theatre and is apparently shocked that there's a get-out in the evening and there's noise behind the theatre. But that's the only example I know, whereas across the country there are so many from people that move near a music venue and then say, well, people leave late at night or, oh, I can sometimes hear music. And for some reason, the way that music venues are perceived means that that seems okay to complain about in a way that doesn't often happen for more recognised cultural venues doesn't tend to happen for concert halls or opera houses or theatres. So it, it's a repositioning that we seek. 
um, obviously for very practical things such as which bit of planning legislation applies, but, but also a more general cultural issue across the UK. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Andy Whiteman. Uh, thanks very much. Um, thanks very much, convener. Um, <clears throat> following you know, Graham's line of questioning here, we, you know, we have the letter from the chief planner to, to um, planning authorities, and we have a statement of intent by the planning minister to incorporate the agent change principle uh, into the national planning framework uh, in future. Um, obviously, in National planning framework is, 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 is belongs to ministers. We get very limited scrutiny of that. Scottish planning policy as ministers, again, they can change that. They could change it. They could break the promise. We may have a different government that doesn't implement it when the next national planning framework comes along, for example. Um, what I suppose we're keen to hear is whether you think that that is sufficient and that deals with the question of introducing an agents of change principle, bearing in mind that every application is always dealt with on its own merits, in its own circumstances, and upon its own facts. It doesn't guarantee anything. Um, whether that's sufficient, and if it's not sufficient, what do you think we could put on the face of a piece of primary legislation which doesn't normally deal with this kind of question, because it deals with process, because the decision maker ultimately makes the decision? What could we put in? And specifically, you mentioned a Beverly use classes, and I'm looking at the, the Scottish use class orders 1997 order, there's there's nothing there on music venues as such. Do you think there's an issue there that um, that, that needs addressed? I, I think, sorry, I know Tom has something to say, but yes, on that question very specifically, we have had many discussions um, with governments in the various bits of the UK where when policy is created, people said, well, within cultural venues, we knew we meant grassroots music venues, but the space at the moment between what's intended by the person writing the policy and how it might be interpreted at local authority level actually is proving a real issue for our venues in that it might have been intended to be seen as a cultural venue, but if you then get somebody in the local authority that doesn't perceive it as that, they can say, well, no, a cultural venue is a theatre. It's not a grassroots music venue. So the actual specifying actually as has been done in the minister's letter which was great it actually specifically said music venues and protecting these and recognizing their cultural importance that is something that we would very much like to see more of because it's very explicit and it doesn't leave room for interpretation but to go a little bit further on the interpretation question i can give an example in England, where a local authority very strongly supported a music venue that was being subject to redevelopment. And this was the Fleece in Bristol. And Bristol City Council told the developer who was converting an office block next to the building that they wanted to see non-openable windows on the side of the building that overlooked the venue. And it went through Brit Bristol City Council and this was all agreed. The developer then went to the planning inspectorate and said, by point of law, we don't actually have to do this, do we? Because it's not actually legislation, it's their recommendation. And I know you don't have a planning inspectorate, but the mechanism's um, similar. But the planning inspectorate agreed with the developer's lawyer and not only overturned the Bristol City Council decree but also gave Bristol City Council the expenses of it having been questioned which has now made that City Council very wary about trying to support the venues further and there are currently six venues in Bristol that are endangered by development so my board member who's a barrister says it's to do with the grey area between policy and legislation where absolutely it can be known what's intended by it but if there's wiggle room if a developer has determination and money, they can quite often find the space to say, well, I don't really have to do that, do I? C can I suggest, therefore, if that um, is the case, and that, um, I, mean, I think some of the parallels there may well apply in, in the Scottish case, but I can't, I can't, I can't be sure, um, that you, given you have an opportunity now, uh, we have a couple of months, uh, before we produce our stage one report, um, I think we need to be very, very clear as a committee about what it is we can do, because we're not the government, we're Parliament, we're making a law, uh, what we can do uh, to buttress the arguments you're making, if we so 
if they think it merits doing so. In that respect, coming forward with specific, broad um, amendments, I mean, not, not the black and white letter of it, but, you know, place a duty to place a whatever, um, because it's hard for us to get to grips uh, with some of this uh, detail. Nevertheless, it would be very unfortunate if we were to see a position where it was deemed that the guidance is, is good enough, and we took that view, and then a year down the line, we see a music venue in Aberdeen or, or Glasgow being subject to the legal challenges you talk about took place in Bristol, and everyone all said, well, I thought Parliament dealt with that, and it obviously didn't. So that's just an encouragement, in a sense, more than an encouragement. Well, entirely, it's up to you, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Received, thank you. Um, I, I know Mr Steele was keen to, to comment. Yeah. I mean, I think in, in some respects, it, it, I think in, it's an opportunity for, for you to, to maybe tease out, is the legally binding nature of, of the, the new changes within the, the bill itself and to what extent that actually strengthens the, the statutory provisions. I mean, the, um, the announcement um, which took place in, in uh, January in England was, was very clear in the government statement um, in, in England that the pro pro proposals would be legally binding. And I think that's the, um, the, the, the real opportunity, I think, for, for this committee to maybe, maybe draw out. As I said, um, there is a, a potential to have an amendment around, which actually places, as I said, an actual duty with on planning authorities to, to prevent unreasonable consequences on existing businesses. And that in itself, um, I think, could could sort of double up and support the recent policy announcements and, and help very much in that, that regard too. Um, and, and beyond that, as I said, I think there could also be commitments for, for developers to actually come forward and actually be a requirement, particularly when they, they are bringing something forward um, which will impact on an area which effectively makes noise, whether it's actually um, a speedway track or whether it's a, a music venue, it doesn't, doesn't have to be a music venue, that they are actually then required to set out exactly how they plan to address those issues um, in terms of note how the information that future residents, et cetera, would, would get into. I think those are the maybe concrete areas where the bill could maybe be, amendments could be tabled and we would happily look, go away and, and look at how that, that can be addressed further. I mean, you're coming to give evidence and we've had written evidence and that's it. But there's a contra-argument, of course, you could find a grassroots music, music venue that is on its last knees, really not, you know, performing very well. Uh, you've got a very large redevelopment plan, which is strongly in the public interest. Um, the idea that a, a small failing business, and obviously not all music venues, but you, you, they, that happens, um, could kind of hold to ransom. Um, public development that is in the public it would, would, be, would be something we'd be concerned about. So get it, getting this duty and obligation right and giving the appropriate discretion to planning authorities would be vital. You're agreed with that? Yes. yes. Right, thank you. Okay, I just wonder if we could maybe look at a couple of other things. I was very intrigued to, to see that the Music Venue Trust was talking about uh, development plans back on the planning process again. Could have areas, designated areas of cultural significance. I'm just wondering... What kind of advantage there would be to that, and, what, and what, what, what the benefits of that would be? I'm kind of struck when I look at that. I'm thinking about we were speaking for two hours about local place plans and just that idea of trying to work out who the community actually were in a local place in, in, in the first instance. And in certain, you know, certain parts of Glasgow, you think of the community as being, you know, a creative community as well as a, a kind of maybe a newly residential community that have arrived in an area or or, or a new hotel that's open. So. Um, areas of cultural significance, what would the benefit of that be and how do you think it would work? I think it's it's about defining an area not only for people that might choose to move there, understanding the nature of that area, but also having key parts of towns and cities that are seen for a focus for that creative activity. I know, for example, in Montreal, there was a, a large redevelopment of an area where they specifically were creating an outdoor performance space and studio space for creatives. And the accommodation that was built there was aimed towards people who work in the creative industries so that they would understand how that area operated and basically be comfortable with the fact that sometimes it would be noisy or chaotic or, or creative in a way that perhaps other members of the wider community might not feel so comfortable. Um, in the UK, this has come up specifically in Cardiff around the Walmond Street area following the consultation with uh, the Welsh Planning Department, Welsh Government Planning Department, because there were a number of proposed developments 
on that street that did not take into account at all the fact that it's a main focus of the live music community in Cardiff. Not that most of those people live there, but it is where people automatically go to if they want to see live music. And there is now a piece of work going on there about protecting that zone for the cultural contribution it brings to the city and scrutinising any planning applications as to whether they enhance that or endanger it. That absolutely makes sense. Um, is, is there, could there be a lot of unintended consequence around that if you had, um, you know, not, not, not everyone stays in a large urban area that's got their kind of creative or cultural places to go for, you know, for their nights out. There's a range of venues there and you can pick and choose and you kind of go along. Some places might just have the the, the, the one the one venue and it actually it might not might have, might not have started off as like a venue for performance, but more and more small towns and rural areas, it, it might actually be the only place where you can you can do that that kind of thing. So, could the unintended consequence be that if you're not in an area of cultural significance, could it weaken the music venue? I think it's it's a real um, concern to make sure that if zoning or cultural significant areas are referenced, that it, it's done on the understanding that that's appropriate for large towns and cities, but not for the whole of the, the country. Um, I absolutely agree that in many towns there will be one or two cultural venues, and of course there's no zone, they're just where they are. The vast majority of our venues are not purpose-built. They're almost all conversions from something else into a music venue. So the zoning is really an issue for major towns and cities rather than everywhere. OK, I suppose the, the key question we have to ask and let other members in a wee second is, do you think the proposal that the Scottish Government has made will impact on decisions of local authorities currently considering noise complaints against existing venues? So my understanding of the Scottish Government position is there's actually provisions there already, but they'll be beefed up. Um, in, in a few months' time, and they've reminded local authorities of what powers they already have. Do you have any sense that local authorities will be watching any of this, or it will, uh, it might, might temper some of the decisions they make? I think the communication that, that comes from Scottish Government to local authorities is key, really. I think it's obviously this is a pivotal moment with having a piece of legislation going through um, the Scottish Parliament to, to make some changes and I think um, the recent changes have been well communicated um, last week and I think any further changes about about, about this I think I think if there are provisions that already exist in, in this place uh, then I think that in the, if they haven't been enforced previously then that, that represents to some extent a failure to, to communicate that, those adequately enough um, and maybe that's an issue for both industry and, and government and, and local authorities to work more together more collaborative in how they can actually communicate those those changes. Okay, it's certainly a question for us to ask the minister when when, when he comes along. Just one final question for me. Then Alexander Stewart's indicated he, want, he wants to come in and, and raise a point. So, agent a change. We are thinking about music venues. That that that's the core purpose of what they do. It's not an add-on. So we serve food, get someone in with a guitar, just to draw up some more business. Those are good venues as well. But I'm just saying you're very clear about about that. Um, should the agent of change principle be extended to cinemas, theatres? Because uh, once the principle is established, they end decide which, which which types of the industry that applies to. So, how widely would you draw the the principle? When Music Venue Trust first started talking about agent of change, which was in two thousand and fifteen, we were actually approached by. A glorious array of different businesses and different people that one couldn't believe that it wasn't the law of the land already because it seems logical and two said well this is brilliant because it would stop this silly thing happening that happened to me and just to give you a couple of the examples of the sorts of things that came up there's a speedway track in England uh, there was a housing development very nearby that the street was called speedway close people bought the houses and moved into it and immediately started complaining to the local council that they were being disturbed by the sound of the speedway track. <laughs> uh, the other example is the couple that we heard about who moved to a countryside village and immediately put in a complaint to the local council that the church bells were disturbing their peace, having moved to the countryside. So I think our feeling is that we are absolutely <coughs> delighted that the minister has specifically referenced music venues and agent of change but we would see any policy or legislation about agent of change having ramifications for other applications 
and helping people that have something that exists being questioned by somebody that moves in and going, I don't like that. That's very helpful, Tom Q. Um, just to sort of build on what, what Beverly said as well, I mean, I think it's important to recognise, um, yes, this bill concerns planning, but it, there is a crossover with the licensing system. And I think that's that that, that can't go sort of be forgotten about, really, because I think effectively... There should be it should be more more joined up in some ways the planning processes and the licensing process effectively decisions have been taken at a planning level and effectively there's a need to preempt what licensing challenges there might be further down the line um i think the, the house of lords had a long-standing inquiry the la in the last parliament um looking into um licensing in general and i think one of the recommendations they came out up with was actually to bring forward more planning and licensing committees those decision making processes to actually take place in, in tandem much more and i think that's if if that is within the scope of this bill i think that could be certainly a very a very positive move to, to look at how that could be maybe developed further to actually help some of the issues that we're we're maybe concerned with but i understand obviously this is purely a bill about planning and there might be issues for you for you around that a particular opportunity to put it on the record of course we're drawing towards the close of this particular session alexander stewart of course yes alexander it, stewart. it was it was similar to what you've just touched on i mean it was about the the, the practicalities of trying to ensure that the planning and the licensing is more aligned to doing and, and you've identified in the evidence you've just given there about having committees come together uh, but what what other practical processes do you think that should be identified uh, to try and and alleviate some of the difficulties that that have happened across other locations i mean we've um i mean we we've been talking more, more generally about how the music industry itself can work more collaboratively with local authorities, with, with planners. Um, we've actually had success within London and in the sense that they've set up a music board which brings together a lot of those 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 issues so i think a lot of the i mean there's a there's a there's an extent where you can actually how to what extent can you deal with actually some of these problems offline if, if you like how can you actually create structures which enables the music industry to have um frank discussions with um with planners and, and licensing people which they don't necessarily normally talk to in, in those kind of structures and how can you maybe develop that further and i think it'd be very positive if um if that was developed in Scotland too to look at some particularly in in some of the large urban areas such as Glasgow and um, uh, and Edinburgh who have very well developed music industries about how they can create those those kind of forums to actually enable some of those discussions to, to take place and then you don't necessarily have to get into a, a legalistic legislative um, problem you kind of hit things off at, at the early early point I might just add something to that. I did a piece of work for City of Edinburgh Council a few years ago looking at the inaudibility clause and at the time that involved quite a lot of discussions about how when someone complained to the council how that was handled and one of the things that struck me particularly forcibly was that the complainant was always considered to be the council's client and the noisemaker was therefore the defendant and one of the things that, that I stated in that piece of work was well it's almost like you've already decided who the guilty party is just by the way you handle that complaint and I believe there's a lot of room for reinforcing recommendations made through planning in the way that council should then deal with noise complaints should they happen after that because it's not very helpful if you're not viewing it objectively if you're saying well that person complained so they must be right thank you Kevin. Um, I think most of the key points have been covered, but I suppose a couple of things. Um, uh, Tom, you mentioned Australia in your opening remarks, and the approach there is to have enshrined this into to law. So it'd be good to sort of maybe get some more info on, on how that's been going. In terms of the, the practical nuts and bolts of it, I know we can't talk about um, individual planning applications here today, but I wondered what the what the experience has been of, of venues who uh, are maybe having to make representations, um, buy in expert advice, perhaps, um, you know, um, undertake their own noise impact assessment. So what's the, sort of the practical side of that and, and what are some of the, the costs? And we've touched on the, the synergy between lic licensing and, and planning. Um, in Scotland, um, people who councils who sit on licensing boards have to undergo training and set a test. The bill's proposing the same for for uh, people who sit on 
um, on the, the planning committees. I wonder if you have a, a view um, on that. And lastly, we spent a lot of time, I know you were outside, we spent a lot of time talking about um, rights of appeal. And is that something that, um, that venues would have a view on who've been very involved in the planning process? Do they have a view on um, being able to make a, a, an appeal when something doesn't go their way? I will do my best to comment from a venue's point of view. Obviously, it's very disappointing that our venue reps weren't actually able to join us, but I'll, I'll tell you what I know from Music Venue Trust's side of things. The, the main thing to say is that letters from a local council are very scary to most people that own a music venue. And the first thing they're likely to do is panic if they receive one, whether it's a noise complaint or a notification of planning nearby. Because... They already have a full-time job doing running the venue and doing other things. And when asked to confront an extra challenge, quite often they feel very unprepared for that and they feel like they don't have the time to do it. Music Venue Trust offers an emergency response service where any music venue within our Music Venues Alliance network across the country can ask us for expert advice. We have a number of what we call our gurus, our planning, licensing, legal experts who will support with advice but obviously that can only go so far so yes there is a cost implication if it's a long journey to see through um, the case against a planning application um, I think the other thing to say is when it's a case like King Tut's where there have been three developments that have come up in five months that's then a huge extra time burden as well as potential financial burden on a business that's quite poorly resourced anyway a lot a lot of our venues are run by very small teams and so the person that's having to get their head around the planning policy and, and, you know, what they have to do to respond and talk to the lawyers and what have you is also the person that's probably cleaning the toilets and rolling in the beer barrels and wel welcoming the band. And so it's a, it's a huge challenge for a small business to deal with an extra factor on top of what they already do. And although we do try and offer support, we are also a very small organisation, so we're very stretched on the resources that we can offer. So it is something that is better than it was a few years ago, but it's still extremely challenging for the sector to try and cope with those external factors having such a big impact on their day-to-day -day existence. To pick up on the point about um, Australia, um, you know, that burden that, that Beverly's described um, with this, uh, the legal um, certainty in Australia, have venues reported back that some of that uncertainty and that, that burden has, has minimised? I, I understand that the Australian situation has, has worked quite well. I think the one area where they, they are maybe having slight issues with is the fact that I think there is a sort of geographical limit applied to their version of agent of change, so that it, it can only apply where there's a certain, I can't remember off the top of my head exactly what that, that radius is, but it can only apply in those circumstances. And I think that has created some issues because obviously when you're dealing with noise, that's, it's sometimes quite hard to actually put a, um, a, a, how far that, that sound may travel and what the impact that may have on other areas. And I think that's something I think that they're certainly looking into to, to want to improve it, to actually make it um, more about the vicinity rather than putting an actual kind of um, jurisdiction distance um, measurement in terms of how the agent of change a principle would apply in there. Um, just to pick up on the your other point about the training um, aspect, I mean, I think that certainly would be would be very important um, to have to have that take place. I think the more the more that can be done for uh, uh, pl those working within planning um, institutions to understand um, various aspects of this would be would be important. One final point. Um, I mean, it looks it's useful to get the overview of what's happening across the UK. So, if we did try and tackle this through the bill, Scotland could be, I suppose, leading um, the UK in terms of um, our approach. Is there another opportunity, perhaps through building regulations or uh, building standards, um, if a developer knew that there were certain minimum requirements in terms of retrofitting or, or even in new builds that had to be built into to the, the building process, would that be another opportunity to tackle some of this if those um, obligations were you know, codified in the building regulations, would, would that, you know, negate the need to have it in, in planning legislation? I'd have to look into that into a bit more detail, I think, before giving, like, a, a specific mm -hmm. commitment now. But, I mean, I think, obviously, the more tools that are available to government to actually achieve some of these things, then, then I think the better. Okay, 
can I just add that actually Scotland is already leading the way from the letter that the minister issued to local authorities. That hasn't happened anywhere else in the UK to have such a, a strongly worded message direct to local authorities. So Scotland actually is in the forefront already. Excellent. That's what we'd like to hear. <laughs> That would be a lovely way to end this evidence session. Please capture that, everyone. Um, thank you to both of you uh, for giving evidence. Um, obviously, the weather defeated us in relation to, to, to other witnesses, but we're grateful for their willingness to make themselves available and for your willingness to wait for a significant period of time before having the opportunity to give your evidence. So that concludes Agenda Item 1. Thank you for that. Please follow the work of the committee on this matter. And we now move to Agenda Item 2 which is subordinate legislation, and the committee will consider negative instruments 38, 39 and 45 as listed on the agenda. These instruments are laid under the negative procedure, which means their provisions will come into force unless the Parliament votes on motions to annul them. Uh, I can tell the committee that no motions to annul have been laid, and I can invite members to make any comments they may have on the instruments before us. I don't see anyone wishing to make a comment in relation to that, so can I invite the committee to agree that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to these instruments? Are we agreed? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. We now move into private session as previously agreed. Thank you.